three, two, one. Good evening and welcome to the online meeting of the Northampton School Committee for Thursday, May 14th, 2020. Uh, this is a meeting being conducted by Zoom meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law issued on March 12th. Um, this meeting is being uh, recorded um, both audio and video um, and is being broadcast on Northampton Open Media. Um, we'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Member Kaufman. Present. Member Goldman. Present. Member Voss. Present. Member Gold. Present. Mayor Narkowitz. Present. Member Busansky. Present. Member, Member Fallon. Present. Member Serafi Cox. Present. Member Condon. Present. Member Levy. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, the next item on our agenda is a public comment period. Um, the way we have been conducting this online is that we have been asking people who wish to speak in public comment to please um, use the raise hand function um, on their Zoom uh, uh, screen. If you are unable to, if you're not connected via um, computer, if you're connected strictly by phone, you can use the star nine to indicate that you wish to raise your hand. Um, so we'll start. If, is there anyone who wishes to speak um, in public comment at this time? Okay. Um, not seeing anyone uh, raising a hand at this point. Um, I don't know whether there may be people, I'm just looking to see, it doesn't look like we have, um, we have one, um, we have one person with a phone num number ending in uh, 6671. Um, are you someone that may wish to speak in public comment? No. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, and believe 3960 is you, correct, John? I believe that's correct, yes. That's correct. Okay. okay, so I don't see any other phone numbers, um, which leads me to believe that everyone who's joined us uh, from the public um, um, understood the request and there's no one who wishes to speak in public comment. So we will then move to announcements by members of the school committee. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Again, if you could raise hands. Um, okay, I don't see any announcements uh, from members of the school committee. So the next items on our agenda is the uh, uh, recommended actions and it involves the consent agenda and we have um, approval of minutes of the school committee meetings of February 13th, February 27th, March 12th, and March 26th, um, as well as, well, I believe that's the complete consent agenda. So is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay, motion made by second old and seconded by member Fallon. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, you must indicate so during the roll call by voting yes. Uh, Mayor? Yes. We don't have, so I don't know how we do this. We don't have all of those minutes though. Okay, so which ones um, need to be removed? Uh, remove, so I would like to remove the minutes. Um, and of course my screen just went blank. Um, remove the minutes of March 12th, 2020 and March 26th, 2020. Okay, excellent. That, that is your, that, that 
It's good. So that leaves us just with the two meet meeting minutes from February the 13th and the 27th. Um, so uh, motion made and seconded, and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion to approve the consent agenda. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narquist? Yes. Member Busanski? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. And Member Kaufman? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. The motion passes, and so the consent agenda is approved. Um, we'll now move to the reports and recommendations portion of the agenda. Um, and as we always begin with a report from our student representative, El or over to you. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Um, so I guess as usual, because of quarantine, we haven't really been able to focus on what we were focusing on before this all started, but we've still been having um, you know, more casual Zoom meetings every other week. Um, and we've also had a few meetings with the administration um, at like the cabinet of the student union, which has been really helpful. And it's been good to connect with them um, in this kind of like weird unsettling time and just, uh, yeah, know that they're still there to connect with us and, and, um, and we've had some good conversation with them. So that's really good. It's been good to see them too. Um, we miss everybody. Um, and you are being good. sarcastic because uh, <laughs> um, we've we it's been it has been good to see everybody. I think um, we are. I mean, I'm a senior and I get to leave in a week, a week from tomorrow. So that's exciting. But um, it's it's going to be bittersweet, I think. And it's definitely been good to see everybody's faces uh, before we before I have to leave. Um, but anyways, so um, kind of what we've been doing uh, for the past few weeks, I guess, for the past month, um, we kind of did like a little informal survey on our Instagram page that just asked students um, how they were feeling um, during this time and like if, if they thought that students with extenuating circumstances, um, like in their home environment, maybe one of their family members were sick or maybe something else was going on that was making it more difficult for them to um, uh, do virtual learning or maybe they're essential workers, um, stuff like that. And we were just asking if they thought that students who had those circumstances um, were getting the support that they needed. Um, we got 55 responses and I believe 39 of them said, no, but we, it was, we were just kind of, but not many people like elaborated on that when we asked. Um, we did also put together like a small survey, uh, like a Google form for students if they wanted to remain anonymous, um, just asking the same questions or if they had more specific things that they wanted to talk about, not in a public space. Um, and we got 23 responses for that. And I think with these two surveys, we were kind of expecting more students to respond. Um, no, just because of the questions we were asking and we wanted to, to see if, if there were students who were having issues. Um, and so for that, this Google form, we got 74% said no, that it, um, they weren't getting the support they needed. But we talked with the administration about it and they had sent out a survey um, asking similar questions and and because it's such a small sample size and we really didn't get to survey the entire school um, there's really not much we can say but I think I'm still glad that we put it out there for students so that they had a space to share how they were feeling and and what they needed um, and we just and after we sent up the survey we just made sure to post our Instagram 
them, like to continue reaching out to their teachers and to administration if they were having issues and they needed more support. Um, and I think I've been hearing from students that that's what they're doing. And the administration has also said that they've gotten a lot of um, responses from students or, or students have reached out to them and say that they need more support. And so I think generally it's going pretty well. Um, but I think, yeah, again, I just want to let you know that we did, we did ask those questions and, um, but overall it seems like things are, things are going well, or at least the issues are being handled, um, and well, so that's good. Um, right now, as, as the year is coming to a close, we're also starting to think a little bit about, um, how to handle elections for both student union members and class officers um, for who will be in those positions next year. Normally they happen, you know, towards the end of June, um, but obviously it won't be the same this year just because we're not in school. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, do we hold them online right now or should we wait until the fall and hold them all then? Um, we're kind of on the fence about it. We've reached out to the class officers to hear what they have to say. Um, I think we've talked to the administration and they're saying to just, you know, to talk about it and, and to figure out what we think would be best and to bring that to them once we've done that. Um, and so I think some of the things that we're mainly trying to think about are like the equib equitability of holding it online. Um, if we were to do that, you know, who, who would be able to access, um, I don't know how we would do if it, if it would be like a survey or a Google form or something that we'd send out, who'd be able to access that and also um, if students would access that or, um, you know, it, would there really be an incentive? Um, additionally, like would as many people run um, for positions uh, if we were to hold them online? Just, and it may be kind of difficult to get um, speeches put together and, and distributed to the students and we don't really want it to be like a popularity contest and we could see that that could happen um, if we were to do it online and you know maybe more students would vote just because they knew someone who was running um, rather than actually paying attention to you know what the person was running for and um, who may be a good candidate so that was something to think about um, but then for the fall, you know, we thought it would be more equitable and generally freshman elections are held um, in the fall anyway. So it keep it would keep everything kind of together on the same playing field if we were to hold them in the fall. Um, but we're also not sure if we're going to be back in the fall. Um, and we also think that it could be pretty hectic just trying to get everybody back on track and kind of picking up from where this year left off. Um, and it may just add more uncertainty if we were to hold them in the fall and not have, um, you know, class officers and student union members in place at the beginning of the year. So that's kind of what we're thinking about. Um, generally, just because of the equitability issue, I think the student union is leaning towards holding them in the fall um, and maybe just like keeping all of the positions that we've had for this year in place until those do occur. Um, but we've, like I said, we've reached out to the class officers to see what they're thinking. Um, and once we have that discussion with them, we'll bring it to the administration and see what they have to say. Um, but I'd also like to hear your input if anybody has any as to what you think may be a better option, but if you don't have anything to say, that's fine too. Does anyone from the school committee have any questions or comments to offer uh, Eleanor on this topic. Um, uh, Member Seraphie Cox. Yes, thank you, Eleanor. Um, I, I don't have a uh, reaction to your uh, last question, but I wanted to go back to the um, to the survey that you sent out. And I'm curious uh, for folks who said that they were having challenges, did you have a way to kind of shepherd them toward um, resources that would be able to help them within the district? We didn't reach out to the students specifically, um, especially because of the Google form was anonymous, but we did 
post something on our Instagram after sending out the survey, just encouraging students to, um, to keep in contact with their teachers and especially to reach out to administration if they were having issues. Um, and then the school administration has also been sending out newsletters that have been doing the same thing and encouraging students and um, posting like, or just telling students who exactly to go to um, and, and when it may be helpful to reach out to administration. And so we like encourage them to read those newsletters and and yeah, and reach out. Um, but we didn't reach out to students specifically. Are there other questions for um, our, our student representative? Yeah, um, Eleanor, were you, did you have more to say or were you, um, were you done and now, were you just asking questions about that one particular topic or did you, or were you done? Cause I had a, a, something else to ask you. Yeah, sure. Um, I was just asking about those particular comments. I didn't have anything else to add specifically about um, student union, but I was just going to talk about like the general goings on going on of the school, I guess. Um, but if you have any other things to bring up, go for it. Um, well, I was just wondering whether this is your last meeting with us. Oh, that's a good question. I was just thinking about that um, earlier today, realizing that technically I wouldn't be a student in Northampton Public Schools after this, um, or at the next meeting. I, I I don't really know. I guess it would be my last meeting, but I'd also love to come to the meeting in June because I know that technically like school would still be in session. Um, I, I don't know if, is that okay? Can I still do like a student report in June if I'm not a student? <laughs> um, uh, well, I hope so. Any objection to that? If you were willing to do that. But, sorry, you cut out for a second. You would be? I said I don't think there would be any objection. Okay. All right. So I'll be there in June. I'll come to the meeting in June. That'll be my last meeting. Okay. And what are you doing next year? Just curious. Yeah, um, I'm going to go to McAllister College next year. Uh -huh. um, I've been accepted there. And yeah, that's where I'm going to go. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. It's been an exciting. I just made that official this week actually so yeah yeah um, thank you um so do you want to do you have more to continue with your report tonight yeah i was just going to say that um ap testing is being held for students at the high school who are um taking ap classes it's really weird i just took my first one this week they're really short they're like 50 minute long tests and they have one or two questions each um but I, it seems like they're going well. It was an easy platform to use and um, it was over quickly. So um, yeah, that's what's happening. And then also some of you guys may have heard about the senior activities that are going on kind of in lieu of graduation or um, as graduation, we're gonna have um, kind of like a drive-through diploma pickup on June 6th, um, which will be fun and they've staggered um all of the class members um and given like specific times for students to drive by and um i think i'm excited that that's going to be able to happen and um i think it'll be a good celebration for the class of 2020 um even though we don't get to have a real graduation i guess um and then we'll also have a zoom um graduation later in june um where I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work, but they're going to be able to show everybody um, like walking across the stage, I guess, and um, also throwing up their their caps at the end, um, which I think will be exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing how that works out. Um, and that one, you know, more people are invited and you can invite friends and family and they can watch it. I believe it'll be on YouTube. Um, so that's exciting but those are kind of the senior year plans, um, which I'm looking forward to. And yeah, I think that's about it for what's happening, I guess, whole school wise right now um, and also in the student union, but yeah. So I think that finishes my report. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for that update. And um, again, thank you for your service and we'll look forward to seeing you um, 
in June for one final report before you um, head off into the next next adventure. Yeah, of course. Educational career. Um, okay. Inadvertently missed a hand during the minutes, um, and I think believe member Levy had a identified a, a small typo that uh, needed to be fixed in one of the minutes. Um, uh, and so, but because it's a typo and not a substantial amendment, I think we can just take care of that, have that fixed. Uh, she can pass that along to Annie. Um, generally, Scrivener's errors can be fixed without amendment. Um, and so it, uh, I'll just ask member Levy to pass that on to you um, so that you can get that uh, correct. Um, is that, is that, is that, does that work member Levy? Excellent, great. Um, okay, so um, the next item on our agenda is a vote uh, regarding spring sports fees reimbursement. Um, and I believe we have uh, Mr. Morrison with us this evening um, to discuss that. And I will um, recognize um, our um, athletic director, Mr. Morrison, to discuss that and um, recommendation to the school committee. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening to everyone, uh, all the members of the school committee. Can, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Sometimes I, I'm still getting Zoom affluent where I can uh, make sure that I'm actually being heard versus um, actually muting myself. So what I want to do is share with the school committee is the understanding that um, with the past few months and all the impacts of the COVID-19 virus, when the governor actually made the declaration the schools would not be reopening for the remainder of the semester, the MIAA, which is the governing body for high school sports, also made the declaration uh, publicly that we would not be having a spring sports season. With that being said, uh, the topic of discussion became well, how do we, uh, what's, what options do we have for refunding or dealing with the fact that caregivers have paid user fees associated with the uh, spring sports season and how to best manage that and deal with that, uh, knowing that um, maybe providing them with options as a population, as a group, for how to best manage uh, the process of their funds they have submitted already for the season, seeing as it was not going to occur, how best to deal with that. So I shared with, uh, I believe I shared with the superintendent and I'm hoping that you have the opportunity to see it, a uh, slideshow with information about uh, my proposal for how to manage uh, that particular aspect uh, for dealing with that. Part of the reason that I'm before you is that we are dealing with a substantial amount uh, of money uh, related to the spring season. Uh, overall, and uh, we are looking at somewhere around uh, with all the deposits that were made both electronically and by submission of checks, a value of somewhere in the realm of $34,000 for the spring season alone, if we're, looking, if we're looking at that in terms of revenue that came in in support of that program. And $34,000 is a lot. Uh, of money and just looking at the aspects of refunding it alone is a huge task. So the idea came forth that maybe we could present options for our caregivers, for our constituents where they could entertain uh, and make decisions, inform decisions and take advantage of the options that are available to them on what to do with those particular allocations of money. Um, so with that being said, um, the first part of this, and what I shared was, I came up with three different options. And the first option that I wanted to present to you is that uh, for those, you know, we would present to our, our population that there are three options. The first option would be a refund of their user fees. Uh, Mr. Uh, Morgan? Yes. I just the superintendent um, had a, his hand up, so I wanted to just recognize, I'm not sure what information he wants to convey. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. No problem. I just, I just wanted to ask. I know that you did share that information with me, and it was forwarded to the school committee. Okay. Would it be helpful if we had any screen share that 
so that everyone can see what you're talking about? Uh, sure. I'm not proficient with how to do a screen share, um, but, but if uh, any can do that, I believe if okay. she has. Yeah, I will try to do that. Give me a moment here. Okay. And, and while Annie is uh, getting that together, uh, I worked with uh, the principal and the uh, leadership team in developing uh, of the plan, the graduation plan for our class of 2020 seniors. And I wanted to um, share with you the information that we have put together uh, that's been you know, publicly shared in terms of that particular class and things that are happening for that and have been communicated in conjunction with meetings with the group, both seniors and their leadership teams. Uh, as Eleanor mentioned earlier, the, uh, we have a senior checkout and graduation attire pickup, and that's going mm. to be, I'm sorry. And that's going to be um, occurring. And that's that time that the seniors will come to the high school and they will basically drive through the parking lot in a parade type format and uh, staggered at appropriate times, making their way to the front of the school. And the front of the school will be decorated at that time. I'm sorry, I'm talking about the, the diploma drive through I'm sorry, on June 7th. On June 7th, there'll be a diploma drive through and celebration. And what we're going to do is we're gonna have the, the, the parents and students that would come in their cars and they enter the parking lot through Milton Street and they will be greeted by different uh, members of the faculty, all socially distant from one another, uh, celebrating with signs and jubilation, the fact that the seniors are coming back to the campus. And as the seniors drive through the parking lot, working their way up towards the front of the school, around the loop to the front of the building, there will also be uh, tables and balloons and, and, and arches and banners to celebrate the seniors again being back at campus. It's at that time they'll pick up their diploma jacket. They'll be able to wear their cap and gown. They'll be able to uh, take pictures in front of the school that will be used as part of the virtual graduation. And then they'll proceed onward with their, with their uh, things that they have picked up and the next one will come through. And it is it's presented to be a very jubilant and celebratory uh, uh, event for them with the understanding that they wanted to have something on their actual day of graduation. And it's something that we have planned with the student leaders. It's something we've already discussed and got permissive, uh, permission through with the uh, police detail and such. So it's a very uh, enthusiastic uh, thing that we're doing for them on the date of their graduation. We're gonna be using those pictures and we're gonna be communicating with them for a virtual graduation that we're going to have with them on Zoom on June 21st at 2 p.m. Uh, students will be, again, able to view the pictures that they took at the diploma drive-through. We're asking them to do personal uh, submissions of different things they would like to share. We'll have student speakers, we'll have invited guests, we'll have music, we'll have everything put together in a wonderful format. I wish you could have uh, seen the one that was done by Jostens the company that we're referencing and working with. They did a tremendous presentation to give an example of what we can offer for our students to give them that experience as well. And the wonderful thing about having it uh, on Zoom is it's going to be recorded so it can be shared and reviewed and shown with anyone, uh, not just the ones that were part of the initial event, but for family and friends near and far, which is great as well. There'll be music, singing, speeches, and everything as part of that celebration. We are also uh, working at working with Look Park to have, and everything is speculative at this point when we're talking about August, but we want to give them uh, a one last class of 2020 post-graduation gathering and achievement ceremony at Look Park at the Dow Pavilion. Uh, again, this is all dependent on where we are at this time and what is allowed according to the protocols for the state. But if the restrictions are, less, are loosened enough, we're going to have a barbecue and celebration at Look Park. Uh, I've already spoken to the contact personnel there and they're totally behind it and supportive of it. And the kids will be able to, once again, if they choose to 
wear their caps and gowns and, and greet and meet with one another as a group in a social set in a social gathering. They'll be able to sign the yearbooks and they'll be able to just enjoy the fact that they've you know made it through this whole unique experience as a group uh, and go forward from there. So we've had quite a few things planned for this class uh, and we're looking forward to uh, a supportive and, and, and caring and, and, and celebratory environment for them. Thank you for that update um, on the on the graduation uh, ceremony. Do you, um, Annie, were you able to display that um, document or screen share it? I should say. Yeah, I just I actually just received it myself, so I am loading it and I'm about to share it. Excellent. Okay. Can everybody see it? It's just about loaded. It's uh, uh, there. We go. Okay. All right, so that's the first slide. And the second slide that's there. Apologies. Just, you know, <laughs> that's fine. Okay. Okay. Mark, just tell me when to get to the, there we go. <laughs> Okay, that's just a little historical aspect that's associated with, um, you know, where we are and how we got to the point where we are having the discussion concerning user fees for the spring sports program. You may go to the next slide, Annie. Thank you. So as I said before, when I looked back over the information that I had and financially uh, over for the spring season, uh, I just onset with the monies that were uh, given as ways of uh, paying for user fees, which run uh, a good portion of the program. There was about $34,000 that came in, in terms of checks and electronic deposits made by caregivers towards their children participating in the spring season. So that's uh, approximately what's been deposited. And with that being said, uh, without there being an onset of a spring season, we would have to have discussion concerning how we want to reimburse or uh, provide options for those individuals who have made these, uh, you know, uh, pay these fees for the program. The next slide, Annie. So with that in mind, I decided to, in, con in conjunction with uh, talking with uh, others, including superintendent, come up with a way to provide options for our caregivers to, uh, you know, either to make decisions, inform decisions on what next step, what steps they would like to take next concerning the user fees. Um, I wanted there to be options that would allow them to understand that they could, you know, take advantage of these uh, set options in a manner that's more, most comfortable for them. And that we had taken the time to consider that, the, you know, whatever their desires or needs were, that we are actually taking the time to consider uh, putting them first, and yet at the same time, giving them the opportunities to make decisions based on that. So option one would be for them to be able to request, if they so desire, a, a total refund of their user fees. Option two would be that the caregiver could decide to have the user fee that they've already submitted for the spring sports program be forwarded to a subsequent or upcoming season of play. Or option three, which would be they could choose to donate the user fees that they've already contributed to our sports program directly to Northampton High School Athletics. And I was presenting option three for perhaps some of our senior parents who, with, if they didn't have any children who would be coming through the program after their child graduates, they would have this option too as a way of giving back to the program that their child has been a part of for the last few years if they chose. Next slide, Annie. So under option one, the user fees have been paid to the district for the student athlete to engage in the high school program would be refunded to the caregiver of the student athletes. So they would uh, submit a request um, and in that request, they would, you know, ask for 
uh, a full refund of the monies that they've already given for the spring program. That would be one of the options that they could avail themselves of. Again, that's something that I will be working with with Cami, and I would have to determine a, re a, a way by which I would be able to share with them uh, that they have you know, this particular option to take advantage of and working with Cami will figure out how to best approach that. Option two is simply that they could choose to have the user fee selectively forwarded to any particular season of play. For example, uh, the spring season did not occur, but the fall season is upcoming. Well, tentatively, depending on again, factors that we don't have any control over as of yet, we just have to wait and see how things go forward. But if there is a fall season or a uh, winter season or spring season for next year, then they, we will present that the, the caregiver would have the option to take the user fee that was paid in the spring and rather than have it refunded to them and then give it back for the fall or for the winter, they could just you know, submit a request that that user fee be applied to a fall sport or that user fee be applied to a spring sport, I'm sorry, to a winter sport or even a spring sport, if they know that their child will, be cho will choose to participate in an upcoming sport in an upcoming season. The third option would be again, perhaps we could give them the opportunity to donate their user fee to NHS athletics. And like I said, this, for me, this is more for perhaps the parents of a high school senior who realized that their you know, well, their, 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 their child is not going to be returning back to the district. They're graduating. They're moving on to college. They're looking for their next transition, and, and they're moving forward. And they, you know, this would allow them to leave something behind as a perhaps the seed donation, a gift donation to this uh, sports program at the high school. This would be something that uh, I know we have protocols where parents can give gifts. Uh, for particular programs as it relates to athletics. And this would be an option for those parents who choose to, rather than receive the refund or, uh, or seeing as they don't have any children or they don't feel the need for that financial contribution to come back to them, that they will simply give it back to the program itself. And the, uh, the, the, the great thing about option three is um, it will lessen the demand upon refunds if they choose to give it back to the uh, program itself as well. And same thing with option two. Option two will lessen the, the workload associated with doing the refunds because the monies will stay where they are currently uh, and, and, and the allocation where they're given and will just be forwarded to another particular season. So rather than look at uh, one option where everyone is refunded, uh, the full value of all, everything that they've given monetarily towards the program by giving them three options, we can reduce the, uh, the work associated with trying to just give blanket refunds to everyone over the, the 300 plus individuals who uh, paid out for the, for the spring season. And we're just dealing with a select few who feel that they need that, mon that monetary uh, contribution back to themselves. Mr. Morrison, we have a question. Um, sure. uh, uh, our school, our student representative, um, Emily Harden had a question. I had your hand up, Emily. Eleanor, sorry, sorry. No worries. Um, it, I was just, I, this isn't really related to the spring sports sure. reimbursement fees. I just wanted to thank you for helping to set up all of the senior events. Um, I know that it was a difficult process and I'm really looking forward to them. So uh, thank you. No, you're very welcome. And you know, you are a perfect example of why we have what we have in our, in our, in our city, in our schools. Um, and you know, even though I don't know you personally, <laughs> Uh, congratulations, and I am proud of you for the direction that you're going in, facing all these different challenges in an, un, in an unknown uh, dynamic. You know, who could have predicted a pandemic and for your senior class? Um, but it's wonderful that you're moving forward with this and finding success in it. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, continue, Mr. Morrison. Is that um, with your presentation? That was it for my presentation. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So um, are there questions from members of the school committee? Um, Member Levy, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you for this really comprehensive presentation and I appreciate the 
three options. They seem really well thought out and really appropriate. I just have a really quick question and I apologize if this um, has been covered and I missed it. Can you tell me what uh, the fees are per student? Well, yeah, the, the blanket fee is $205 uh, for most of the sports. Some sports have uh, more associated with their fee than others. For example, the football has a, uh, a user fee of 225, which is you know 20 above the, 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 blank, the blanket fee. Um, then we have breakdowns for like free and reduced for lunch, for reduced lunch, the fees are usually $40. And if a student qualifies for free lunch, there's no fee associated with that. So the fees are for football, 225. For most sports, 205. Reduced fee is $40. Free lunch is, is no cost associated with it. And we do have a co-op with East, with East Hampton for hockey. And because that sport does require more in terms of rental fees and access to facilities where they can actually, you know, ski, um, where they can actually uh, have access to the, the ice rinks and such at Williston, they pay more. I think the cost there is 300. Thanks. And then outside of hockey, um, what, two questions, what are the fees used for? And then what, um, with any balance that you have left over, what, what would the, that remaining balance go towards? Well, the fees are used for basically running the good majority of the program. They, they are used to supplement that which comes into the local budget. Uh, so the fees make up the, you know, the revolving budget and they cover everything from transportation to equipment to supplies that are associated with any of the particular seasons uh, in general, whether it's fall, winter or spring. Did that um, answer your questions, Member Levy? Uh, one of them, thanks. My, can you hear me? It says I'm muted, but I think I'm not muted. Um, the, so, sin, so I'm just curious if families choose to donate their portion of their fees, what will you do with the funds that you have? With the, you mean with the donated, donation of fees, if they take it, if they uh, avail that option? Is that what you're asking? Well, the, if they choose to gift their user fees to the program, uh, then that's something that I would talk to Cami about because again, a lot of this is speculative right now. Uh, it's dependent upon the school committee's uh, vote uh, in terms of even uh, adopting this as an option for parents. Um, so I would, at, at this point, if, if the school committee says, yes, we will definitely uh, support and vote to present this to our population, to the student, to the caregivers of the student athletes, then I would sit down with Cami, and we would look at how to best manage all of this and make sense of it. Uh, you know, that's more of her role. Uh, she, you know, her job, she kind of leads and guides me in the components of the financial aspects of it. So I don't want to, I don't want to say something that, um, or give you an answer that I can't support without her direction. Speaking of Ms. Lamica, she has her hand up, so I was actually going to recognize her. I assume she wants to weigh in on this question as well. Uh, okay, thought she if did. My, if I can get my buttons to work. You're there. Yes. So I was just going to help out when I heard the question. I was just going to help out, Mark. Um, sure, thank you. So what ends up happening generally is all fees that are collected go into the athletic revolving account, which helps support any expenditures that for the athletic program specifically. If the school committee um, wants to provide that option for parents to choose to donate those funds rather than a fee component, uh, we can do two things because we can send letters out thanking them for their donation, um, which will be helpful for them on their taxes. Um, but also at the same time, I would bring a list to the school committee at a future meeting of the checks that were, um, the amounts that were provided as a gift, the school committee would accept the gift and we would record them in a separate athletic gift account to be used for anything that the um, athletic program needed. So they would use it just like the revolving account. So in other words, they're very specific. It goes from year to year. 
the money doesn't go back to the city, it stays in an account that for a specific purpose can be used for future expenses of the program. Thank you, Cammie. Did that answer your question more fully? Okay, excellent. Um, Member Kaufman, you have your hand up next. Yes, um, Mr. Morrison, I just wanna thank you for both working with the seniors this year and, um, and their graduation options, as well as um, giving us three options on this. I very much appreciate it. I just wanted to raise uh, an issue that I would anticipate some parents might ask. So you might wanna take this into account if this does pass and you communicate, which is let's say a parent or a family or a student, whoever's paying the fee chooses option two. Um, they're a junior and they wanna um, have the money kept in the district for next year. And then if fall sports, for example, maybe this is a student who just plays football and, and we don't have fall sports or we don't have a sport or the student changes their mind. And I'm just wondering in the future, if a, if a family chooses two now, could they later on change it to option one, get their refund or option three to have it donated? Seems, it seems like uh, that might be an issue that folks would raise. Right, and I, I do understand that there's always going to be a possibility of something like that happening. And again, they have the right to do that because unforeseen circumstances may avail themselves where they may either need that money that they thought they could just give towards the sport or their child being, being children could choose, I don't wanna engage in this anymore. Or of course, um, we don't know the outcome uh, of, of the COVID-19 crisis yeah. which, and the impact of it on, in the fall season. So all of that is something that we have to consider as well. And um, the best we can do is give them the options that we uh, have available to them and, and deal with those circumstances if they present themselves. And again, I'll be working very closely with Cami to try and figure out how to best approach that. If yeah, I, mean, I, I think that parents would be considering that at this point if they chose to. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that maybe um, if you are, if, if, you, if you can move ahead with these three options that maybe you just put a footnote or something in there that if you choose option two, that um, what will happen if they then choose not to, if their child then chooses not to play a sport. Mm -hmm. I just think in the area of this, it, it would serve to our advantage if we're clear with parents what their options might be. And if they choose to without knowing what the options might be in the fall, which everybody is aware of may or may not happen, um, that would be unnecessarily confusing to them. So I would advocate just for adding um, a little bit more, more information about what option two means going into next year. Thank you for that. I would definitely sure. include that okay. in the letter. Member Voss, you have your hand up next. Thank you. Um, I'll just echo what my colleagues have said and thank you for all your work on this and the senior um, recognition um, activities. And I just want to make sure I, this whole canceling of sports has made, I think, all of us understand the way that athletics budget works in a much deeper way than perhaps at least I had understood it before. Um, if you were to give all of this $34,000 back to families who have already paid it, my current understanding is that you wouldn't be out of money because that money was really for running the seasons, the transportation, um, maybe officials, whatever. Is that correct? Or has some of that $34,000 been spent? And if some of it has been spent, can, can you just give us like a sense of how much of it we've lost? Uh, the the $34,000 that came in in terms of checks and electronic deposits, that was for the season. Uh, without the onset of the season, uh, I, none of it has been spent to my knowledge. Uh, there were some purchases that were made uh, before the season began, but that was already allocated within the budget. Um, so um, to my knowledge, it's, it's, it's monies that are still there, uh, but we're looking at you know, the possibility that a portion of it uh, will be requested back in terms of financial, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of you know, parents' requests, caregivers' requests for what they've given for whatever reason. Um, to better, again, I'm I'm still learning about the budgetary process, like you mentioned, for the sports program. So maybe I cannot address it fully in a manner that you're looking for at, 
again, that's why we have Cami here. Uh, she's she's the budget person, and she can help guide forward from there. And Ms. Lamica has her hand up. So, Cami, did you want to add something? Sure, uh, just two pieces. So, I I think when you look at it, Member Boss. Um, the revenues that we took in for the spring, the only thing that I would look at it that we probably um, on a budgetary basis, and I don't wanna say are losing out on because we're not, um, are supplies that we made purchases for supplies for the spring season, but yet it's sitting in inventory for the next spring season. It's just, that's what normally those fees for this spring would help pay for those. So it just comes out of the balance that we have in the account. Thank you. Okay, the next person is member Fallon. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Mr. Morrison, um, for your presentation. And I, um, I'd like to make a motion um, to authorize, um, authorize Mr. Morrison to move forward with these three options for spring sports fees reimbursement. Okay, there's a motion made. Is there a second? Second. Uh, member Gold um, seconds and um, is there um, member? Um, sorry, uh, Kimmy, you have your hand up. Is that just a re is that from your prior question or do you have something more to add? I just wanted to offer a suggestion, um, like Member Kaufman had suggested, is if people select the option to have it credited towards next school year. What maybe the school committee would want to do is authorize us if that were to occur and they took a credit towards next year and then for whatever reason within next year if that uh, sport did not happen that we would be authorized to refund to those people next year during next year only so that way then we wouldn't have to come back at it again and people would know and he'd be authorized to do that would you accept that as a friendly, or would you add that as an amendment to your original motion, Member Fallon? Yes. Okay. Okay, um, any further discussion on the uh, motion or, or uh, Mr. Morrison's proposal generally? Would, would you mind just repeating your motion, Laura? Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Um, I move to authorize uh, Mr. Morrison to, um, present families with the three options um, he's presented for spring sports fees reimbursement. With with, with, with the addition. With the amendment. Amendment. <laughs> yeah, I got that. Authorization, yes, exactly. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Okay, um, any further discussion on this particular item? Okay, hearing none, I'll ask Annie to please call the roll. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narquitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, so um, and so now we move on to um, uh, C, which is uh, related to the Student Opportunity Act, um, and it's a vote, and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Provost. Thank you. Uh, I explained this in my email to committee members earlier today. So this is mainly for the public. Uh, let me just begin by saying that the Student Opportunity Act plan process is inherently confusing. To begin with, there were two forms. There's what's known as the long form for districts that were expected to be receiving substantial SOA funds. And then there was what was called the short form for districts like Northampton that were expected to have much more modest SOA funding. In fact, as you'll hear me say in a few minutes, it's, it's even less than modest. Um, so under the law, the, every district was required to create a plan to use its SOA funds. The use of the funds was restricted to 17 evidence-based practices designated by 
DESI, and the essence of the plan was to show how you were going to be spending the additional funding that you'd be receiving through the SOA. Um, so to the point of um, Northampton being one of the short form districts, um, in my opinion, I don't really think Northampton is a beneficiary of SOA funds. Um, the average annual increase to Chapter 70 for Northampton for the past three years has been 1.43%. So after the SOA passed and these new funds were infused into the, the state budget, we're actually projecting a drop in Chapter 70 funding from 1.43, which was a three-year rolling average, to just over 1%, um, and so therefore the short form. With the question of how to fill out the short form, um, because as I'm looking at it, I have either zero dollars to designate how I'm planning, or I have negative amount. So I asked Desi for some guidance and how to fill out the, the plan, and they said what we should do is use the um, just just identify funds that are in the FY21 budget that already align with the 17 evidence-based practices that would be eligible under the SOA and list those funds there. So in this, this plan that you have, um, it's several million dollars. That's not actually SOA money that, that is um, represented. That's the FY21 budget that you passed last month. Um, so another component of the SOA law is that we need to see feedback from the community on how, on, on our plan to spend the SOA funds. So to meet this requirement, I asked for feedback on the plan from the school councils and the CPAC. Um, and one sort of overarching piece of feedback we've gotten is that the process, does, process doesn't seem to make any sense, um, you know, in the sense that we're creating a plan for funding that we're really not receiving, and it doesn't seem so strategic. So I agree with that critique, um, but nevertheless, that is the requirement under the law. Um, so one of the things we did was say, so let's try to imagine that we get to a point where we actually start to see funds from the SOA begin to flow. One of the things that we could use feedback on are the 17 priorities and, and let us know where you'd like us to, to really designate any future SOA funds to go. And so we really heard three, uh, three of the 17 priorities um, identified by our community members as, as worthy of, of future funding. One was priority five, which is expanded access to career and technical education, including after dark district vocational partnerships and innovation pathways reflecting labor market practices Another one that um, was positively received was uh, Priority 8, which is Acceleration Academies and or Summer Learning to support improving skill development and accelerating uh, advanced learners. Another one, um, another one that we received feedback from uh, the, the community on, this was specifically from the, the JFK um, School Council, was that the priority for additional funding for co-teaching for inclusion and English language learners would be a good place to um, put any future SOA funds. Um, so the, uh, that's the plan and that's the feedback. Um, in order to submit this, there is a required school committee vote approving it and also a required um, attest attestation on my part that the, um, we received and I reported out the feedback from our local community. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Provost. And so you're essentially asking for a vote this evening um, to, to essentially approve this um, submission that you're gonna be sending to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. That's correct. Okay. Is there anyone who wishes to make a motion to put that on the floor so that we can talk about it? Uh, I'd move to um, approve the Student Opportunity Act presentation. Second that motion. Okay, Member Condon seconds. 
any discussion on this item? Okay. I just, I just wanted to say, I, I am so sorry that this exercise and frustration was put on Dr. Provost and our employees and our student councils, um, school councils during this time. And it, it's really frustrating how hard everyone worked to get this passed. And now it's essentially extra paperwork um, with no return, in fact, less return um, than we would have had before it passed. So that's all. Member Kaufman, you had your hand up. I did, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I completely get how infuriating it must be um, to be required to take the time to write a plan for something we're not getting any SOA money to implement. Um, nobody has the time to do that now. I'm not sure it was the greatest sort of um, uh, questions that we needed to answer, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, at the same time, we, we, we obviously do need a rock solid evidence-based district-wide plan to close gaps. Um, and we're doing, I think we're doing lots of really good things. I don't know if we're adequately capturing that. A plan might do that. A plan might give us an opportunity to reflect on what we're doing. And a plan, I think, certainly would be very helpful to us when we're doing a budget to ensure that we're designating the proper resources to do so. So um, now is not the time, clearly. And I understand doing it under this, these conditions are not ideal. But I just wanted to say that I, I very much um, look forward to a time that we can develop a plan. And I, I think that it probably um, needs to be developed very much in congruence with our um, district improvement plan. So as much as I appreciate how people are talking about how they like to spend the money, I, I, I think we need to talk about that in the greater context of the improvement for the district. And I can't imagine one of our district improvement plans is not going to be about closing the achievement gap. So I see you nodding your head, Dr. Um, Superintendent Prevo. Thank you, Member Kaufman. Uh, Member Gould, you had your hand up next. Yes, um, I just wanted to, you know, second um, what Member Fallon was saying about how, like, sorry, you guys had to go through that. Um, and I do kind of agree with what Mr. Kaufman was saying. I just wanted to ask then is, do you feel like this is something that sort of can be, you know, for us to keep in mind um, these recommendations in terms like, of the future really like this is something we would, could pull out of the drawer and say we could build on this work um in the future or do you think it was it's time is just for now and it was the work was for not if you know what i mean like do you, is it is it something like if the money all of a sudden comes available we could pull this out and, and make use of this this work no i don't think it was completely for not um i think what was good was being able to have even via email and even under kind of a short timeline, a conversation with the school councils about what the state is now identifying as its evidence-based practices. Um, statement I've ever seen of evidence-based practice coming from the state. Um, they, um, as, as some of you probably know, in the last reauthorization of the IDEA, there was um, a requirement that any practices being used by a school in order to implement an IEP needed to be evidence-based, but um, there was a big debate about what that meant. Now the Department of Ed has said it's 17 things. Um, if you're looking at if you're looking to close achievement gaps, these are the strategies, um, and that only came with the SOA. And so I think we have really sort of narrowed the universe of um, interventions to pick from, and I think that um, just getting that awareness in the, out in the community is, is helpful. Member Voss, you have your hand up next. Thank you. So I don't wanna detract from all the work that was done and very much appreciate it. Um, Dr. Provost, correct me if I'm wrong though, that I think the email basically said what Member Fallon and others have said that the this has really become a process just because the money isn't available. And I, I'd like to echo what I think I heard member Kaufman say, which is um, if we were going to use this as a model moving forward, we would want more discussion. Um, I think your email said some of the school councils really came back with some different perspectives on it, if I remember that correctly. So I just, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I, I'm happy to vote to pass this in the context of how it's been presented and move on and realize we have other pressing things, but I also don't wanna pass it thinking that it's done and sitting um, sitting there for, to be used in the future as is, because it, it, 
feels to me as it hasn't been vetted and I don't think it should be vetted further at this point based on my understanding of where we're at. Dr. Carlos, do you concur that this is really a one-off for this particular, I mean, we, we would probably be revisiting it um, if we have to submit a future one. I mean, the other irony here is that the legislature hasn't even funded the Student Opportunity Act and it remains to be seen whether they even will this year or whether it'll be delayed. So um, there may be many districts submitting these plans and there's no actual money in FY 2021 state budget to support it. Okay, I'm getting a nod yes. So um, there has been a motion made and seconded um, and without, if there's no further discussion, I would ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narquitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. You're not, okay. Um, Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Uh, and Member Goldman. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, um, so the next item on our agenda is a required vote to ratify a memorandum of agreement with the Northampton Association of School Employees, NACE. And I will turn to the chair of our negotiations um, subcommittee, uh, member Serafi Cox. Thank you. Um, I am having a little bit of a hard time finding the email that uh, that this document was contained in. Annie, can you direct me to where uh, members of the subcommittee can find this document? I can. Let me, I think I'm able to find it and share it right now. Would that work? Sure. Um, in the meantime, I will say that um, the members of the uh, negotiation subcommittee uh, continue to meet with uh, with NACE and have productive and uh, and really meaningful and helpful conversations. Um, and uh, it is the the goal of both the um, I, I guess I would speak on behalf of the whole uh, uh, school committee uh, to to continue those positive conversations and to make sure that all of our uh, Northampton public school employees know that they um, um, are supported by the school committee uh, and, uh, and the administration during this time. So to that end, uh, we uh, have the negotiation subcommittee with direction from the, uh, the full school committee as a body met with uh, the NACE negotiations team to, uh, to create this, uh, this memorandum of understanding. We, as you may remember, we created a memorandum of understanding uh, back in March, I wanna say. And um, this would be a revision to that memorandum of understanding. Uh, and I see that Annie has uh, has shared it on her screen. Um, this version does not have the red highlights with the changes. Um, but I will say that um, the changes, can you scroll down, Annie? Yeah. Or what, it, was this shared? I, I, I actually, members this of was the- it was this was shared, but I think if you want me to, let me look for the uh, thing with the changes. Okay. Well, um, well okay. Uh, Member Gold may have put it in the chat to me, which will help me uh, in speaking to you all about it. Um, so we, we 
thank you, member gold. This is the, this is what I was looking for. So okay, in the first, uh, you can put back up that, that version that you had there, Annie, okay. in the first, uh, bullet we added to, uh, to our goals that one of our goals is to have a sense of well being for the students, uh, in Northampton. Previously, we had said the best possible educational experience and connection to their school committee, as well as support to employees. And so we added this sense of well being, uh, statement because so much of the work that the Northampton uh, school employees have done during this time is ensure the well-being of, uh, of students during this time. Um, Annie, if you can scroll down to the top of the second page to number five, this is the next change. This uh, was a, um, oh, I think on your version, it's a little farther up. There we are. So, um, this um, references the district's remote learning plan and talks about um, how learning um, and educational um, uh, opportunities are going to happen during this time and, uh, and that we are referencing the district's learning plan uh, because it creates uh, a plan with flexibility uh, as well uh, as, um, as, as enrichment opportunities. So um, one of the goals of this particular uh, bullet was to emphasize that, um, that remote learning is gonna look very different between, uh, between various uh, different learning environments for students, uh, depending on their situations, depending on the situations of the classroom, all of it. Um, as well as that we acknowledge that DESI actually encourages the prioritization of asynchronous lessons for several reasons. And we reference um, those. We also um, uh, have things to, we have definitions about both synchronous and asynchronous learning, uh, remote learning. And um, one of the reasons why we included this uh, was because uh, I think there has been a lot of of feeling in the community of not quite knowing what is the, uh, the, the best way to provide learning opportunities during this time. This is obviously an unprecedented situation. And so uh, we as a community don't have experience in, in knowing uh, what is the best way to proceed. And so um, the, the uh, NACE and the negotiation subcommittee really felt that it was important to make a strong statement about um, what the current research is on remote learning and that we as a district are following that and designing this remote plan together uh, between administrators and educators. Um, so I think then we can go down to number seven. Um, this is, um, previously, we had a statement about um, um, people who were uh, being recalled in person to work. And this statement um, applies to, applies that same sort of self-certification uh, statement that we had talked about before, applies it to um, people who are working remotely. Um, going to number 11. Number 11 is about uh, the unit B uh, as, uh, as well as the clerical unit and the custodial unit members. They um, had previously only been uh, able to roll over a certain number of vacation days, but of course they're not able to take vacation now in the same way that they would have otherwise. And the summer is going to also be a time of great need for, uh, for their for their work for the for the district. So, um, in recognition of the fact of how much work they are putting in to the district, um, uh, we wanted to extend this benefit for them to roll over additional uh, vacation to into the next year, so that they don't have to use it all this year, since we know that they really kind of can't. Um, number twelve is um, is carving out a role for ESPs. 
in, uh, in our previous memorandum of agreement, there was no um, formal role talked about for ESPs. And, uh, and so this states that ESPs will, uh, will coordinate with teachers and administrative staff to support student learning and that it would happen during their regular workday. Um, the last change is in number 14. And it is just that uh, this uh, memorandum of understanding will stay in force until June 16th. The previous uh, memorandum of, uh, sorry, memorandum of agreement. Uh, the previous one said June 19th, which, which, which was of course the, pre the last day of school um, previously. And now it is June 16th uh, since we canceled April vacation. That is my presentation. Um, I would love to uh, see somebody move uh, for us to ratify this memorandum of agreement. You can certainly make that motion yourself, Member Sarah. Oh, very good. Okay, I would like to make a motion to uh, for the school committee to ratify the revised memorandum of understanding with the Northampton uh, Association of School Employees. Back in, back in. Okay. Um, I heard multiple voices, um, so it's clearly been seconded. Um, is there any discussion on the um, motion to ratify? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Oh, sorry, Member Gold. Sorry about that, Member Gold. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add real briefly, make sure in case the public is listening or other folks didn't realize it, that um, it it's somewhat it's definitely unique in some ways that um the depth to which the memorandum goes and the collaboration and the desire to work together from the union and the district and i, I just want to credit both sides of that because i certainly know districts that have not worked to bring that clarity to teachers and and that have had challenges with it so i i appreciate um how much has come out of this uh, collaboration so just wanted to share that part thank you member gold um, any other questions? Okay, I'll ask, oh, uh, Member Serafie Cox. I was just going to echo what uh, Member Gold said that I really want to appreciate um, um, everyone who has been involved uh, in this process and found the, the conversations with NACE to be incredibly productive and, um, and clarifying for our processes. Okay. Thank you for that. Let's, um, seeing no other hands, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. And Member Goldman. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. The motion passes and so this MOA is ratified uh, between the school committee and uh, NACE, and again, thank you to our colleagues on the negotiation subcommittee for the work that they've done um, on this. Um, next, we have a um, requested vote on a contract vacation rollover uh, to FY 2021, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Provost to explain that for the public. Thank you. Um, in much the way that Member Serafie Cox just explained, we have members of the represented units who are unable to take vacation time because they're working so hard at this, in this juncture to get through um, the multiple challenges that arise every day in the COVID-19 era. The same thing is true for administrators. Um, I don't think there's an administrator on the team that's had a vacation day since the winter break. Um, and we're, we're there's no way that we can foresee taking vacation before the end of this, the school year. So we have um, within our contracts, the standard language says that 10 days can be rolled over from year to year. 
but in the light of the special circumstances that apply this year, I would ask that you approve rolling over of all um, non-rep uh, contracts that have vacation days, unused vacation days from this fiscal year into next fiscal year. That would include people such as the school business administrator, the director of student services, myself, and principals, as well as a few other non-rep employees. Is there a motion to uh, to approve that ro vacation rollover? So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. So the motion's made by Member Seraphie Cox and seconded by Member Fallon. Is there any discussion on the um, or questions about the uh, proposed? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. <laughs> Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. And Member Gold. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, so um, so the uh, vacation rollover is approved. Um, next, we have a vote on a gift um, of $4,628 from the EOS Foundation to the Food Service Emergency Meals uh, Program. Um, and I'll ask the uh, uh, business manager to discuss that. So in your packet with information, our food service director, Ms. Delhanna, um, had applied for an EOS Foundation grant when the, they offered such things for the emergency um, meals program. She applied for to buy some extraordinary equipment kind of items, uh, such as coolers and packs and bags and things that will help us distribute food. Um, so we received $4,628 um, to buy those per items that we would need for the program. Um, so I just ask for your approval on that. Is there a motion? So moved. A motion. Second. Okay, sounds like I got a motion by Member Fallon. Um, and I heard Member Gold, but I didn't hear who else made the second on that. Um, I did. Okay, Member Busansky. Okay, so I'll, um, made by Member Fallon, seconded by Member Busansky. Any questions about this uh, very generous gift? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Assuming the mayor's there and is <laughs> Mayor, you're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. I was um, having some difficulty getting it unmuted. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, so the um, that first gift is approved and now we turn to a second gift. Um, this is uh, uh, and FO NHST stipends uh, valued at $12,385. And I'll have Ms. Dimica explain this gift. So this group is better known as Fonts, which is the Friends of Northampton High School Theater. Um, what's happened is this group has um, been working with uh, high school PTO um, under their umbrella at the moment, but they're a separate organization. They've actually um, 
had the ticket sales for the Sound of Music program for this spring that was gonna occur. So what they do is they collect the ticket sales and then they provide the money for the stipends to pay for all the people that put on the productions based on our contract amounts. Um, so right now, um, the payments for those people would be $12,385. They worked since November on the program and they were supposed to have the um, performance the week that we closed. And that's the only thing that they were unable to do. Um, so they have provided us with a check for the um, stipends and I'd ask the committee to accept it and then we could discuss what payment of the stipends after. Okay, is there a motion to approve this? So moved. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made by Member Gold and seconded by Member Fallon. Um, are there any questions based on uh, what Ms. Lemon has described? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. And Member Busansky. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, so um, next up on the agenda is a, um, I believe it's just a report uh, from the business administrator about a um, FY20 uh, budget appropriation from the city to the schools uh, for foster care transportation. Member Lamica, um, <laughs> Business Administrator Lamica. Um, so I just wanted to let the school committee know this is um, the new federal funding portion that we um, had approved in agreement with the um, DESE and the federal folks that we had to do a member, um, memorandum of understanding with back a few months ago. Um, and the first quarter of money has finally come in. So it's $4,248, um, which the mayor puts forward to have the city council approve, which then gets added to our fiscal 20 budget. So I just wanted to inform you that that's happened. City council has voted to approve that and that will be added to our bottom line budget for this year. Um, and that is given to us um, by the federal government for our expenditures in the previous year for foster care transportation costs. Are there any questions uh, uh, for Ms. Lamica about that? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll, oh, sorry, Member Seraphie Cox. I just was curious, um, Ms. Lamica, if you had any notion of if, if there would be a change in this reimbursement for next year, considering that we are not providing this transportation during the closure, or if that's something that is just remain, remaining to be seen. So what this um, reimbursement represents is the last quarter of last fiscal year. Um, so we have to submit annually for the, um, the expenditures. Uh, so I would expect that at least half the year, if not three quarters of the year, fiscal 20, we would be able to apply for reimbursement that will come the following year. Um, and then the last few months, because we were not transporting foster care children, um, would probably be the one quarter that I would not anticipate getting any reimbursement for. Okay, any other questions about this member boss? Thank you, that made me realize I do have a question following up on member Sarafi Cox. Are we currently paying for the busing um, of the foster children, even though we're not busing them to keep up with our contract? That's part A of my question for Ms. Lambert. And, 
And that's going to be on my next piece, but I can answer that we are, we have negotiated to pay a portion if the children are still in Northampton schools. And so I guess part B is, do you know if um, we're allowed to submit what we actually pay next year, or is that an unknown at this point? With the federal piece, it's an unknown. With the state, they have told us, yes, they will. Thank you. Let us reimburse. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, about this. Okay, so this is an informational item. So the next item on the agenda is the aforementioned update from Islamica on the van pool transportation contract. So at a previous meeting, the school committee authorized the superintendent and I to negotiate with our transportation vendors. Um, we had previously informed you what we had reached an agreement with for Durham. Van pool, we've reached an agreement with them. Um, and what we're um, have negotiated is to pay originally with 78% of our costs in between now and the last day of school. Um, and they will keep all their employees um, employed and paid um, and provide us same kind of services um, as needed for meals, deliveries, whatever kind of service we need transportation pieces done. And since we had originally negotiated that, uh, two days ago, I received a phone call that they were able to further reduce that discount um, so that we are now paying 75%. So as they're realizing that there's some stimulus money that's helping them, they are passing those savings on to us as well. So we are at 75% currently of um, the regular daily rate that we would pay. And we have an agreement that for the foster care and um, homeless students, as long as the students stay within our school district and are here, we will pay for it. Um, but if for whatever reason those children move, because there is a, a lot of um, students that do move in that population, that we would not pay those in further once they um, withdraw from our school district. Okay, are there any um, any questions about those contract uh, modifications as described? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on now to reports from our subcommittees. And the first is a report of the Budget and Property Subcommittee from Member Busansky. Thank you. So uh, to start with, the Budget and Property Subcommittee has met twice to discuss uh, late start ideas. Um, and so I wanted to report back to the full school committee and just give you a sort of a status update of what we're at, where we're at. We're progressing along and we're still gathering some more information. Um, but Transportation Supervisor Tammy Lieber has really done a really uh, fantastic job at um, creating a number of proposals and helping walk us through it and then continuing to sort of drill down as we're trying to get some final cost estimates and figure out sort of all the pros and cons and what the impacts will be. So I think you are all, because we did double post the first meeting, you are all privy to the first um, six proposals that um, Ms. Lieber put out. And um, from there, we agreed, uh, we asked her to go back and look further into, I think it was three or four more proposals. And at our last meeting, uh, we got it down to two proposals that we think um, are the most promising. And though all costs aren't included in the estimate, um, such as preschool vans or out of district transportation costs, um, she, uh, Tammy Lieber was able to get us to a point to say that both of these would be um, cost neutral. In other words, there'd be no additional um, cost to running either of these proposals. So that was obviously a factor in our decision um, making. Um, but the first plan is basically to run the elementary school first, uh, JFK second and NHS third. And the second plan that we thought was promising was the elementary school first, NHS second, and JFK last. Each one has to be about a half an hour apart. So that would presume that the elementary school would start about 7.45 or 8 a.m.-ish, give or take a little. Um, and then JFK would start around, or sorry, the second school would start around, school level would start around 
8.15 or 8.30, and the third one would start at nine. So uh, we know that this has some, both plans have some pros and cons involved in them. Both of them say, both of them meet that requirement that everyone had, the full school committee had asked for, that high school doesn't start until, um, well, in this case, it really wouldn't start until 8.15 or 8.30 at the earliest. Um, but one of the draw, main drawbacks would be that elementary start, school starts first and therefore any kids being picked up by older, any elementary children being picked up by older students, which we had, haven't surveyed on at all, um, that would sort of, uh, parents would have to make alternate plans and we could talk about that further. But um, we are still looking into what the impact is going to be on athletics because we'd like to understand what that's going to mean for our students involved in athletics throughout the year. And um, Ms. Lieber is also looking into a late bus option and what the costs would be. What we're talking about is what we sort of laid out was about one hour later after the last drop off, maybe we would do be able to do two to three days per week um, from October to April to kind of try to mitigate some of the costs. And you know, all of this obviously has been being developed in this sort of unprecedented time when we don't really know what our budget will look like and we don't really know what busing will even look like, um, even though uh, come next year, not to mention the following September when we laid out to begin this new late um, later uh, changes to later start and changes to um, student start times. But that's where we're at right now. I'd love if anyone has any comments or questions, um, you know, uh, or if my other, and if my other subcommittee members, Dr. Provost, Ms. Lamica, wanted to add anything else to what I've just presented, that would be great. Member Levy has her hand up, Member Levy. Thanks, thanks for all your work on this. I have a few questions. Is there, did I miss a document or was this sent to us somewhere? No, we, you know, we didn't send it out because we're still collecting all the information and all the, we don't have, uh, Tammy Lieber is still working on drilling down to what the final cost is. So we did not send this out as documents. At our next general meeting, we're going to have this on the agenda. Ms. Lieber is going to come and present it and we'll be able to, we'll make sure, you know, everyone will be receiving documents and we will be discussing it in greater detail. Okay. So... I'm not sure if I should then be saving my questions for that meeting or if I should actually ask them now, but I, I will ask them and you can then mm -hmm. see that. Um, be helpful to ask them now and then we can discuss them. You know, maybe we can, if there's anything to forward to Ms. Lieber, we can do that. And so, yeah. yeah, it would be helpful to know. I imagine, I imagine Ms. Lieber is working this out. Uh, if the elementary school is starting at 745 or eight, what that means the earliest bu bus pickup would be. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, okay. And then we have that time. I'm not sure if I have that piece of paper right in front of me or if uh, Dr. Provost or Ms. Lamica does, but I think the earliest, if uh, elementary school started at eight, I think it was the earliest bus would be between 710 and 720. Is that right? Correct. That's correct. And yeah. just to add to that, because that obviously was part of our discussion, the uh, Dr. Provost provided us, uh, looked up, and the latest civil dawn time uh, that on a school day is 640. So latest civil dawn, dawn time is 640. So if an elementary school student would be picked up around 710, 720, that's light of day. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. That would have been my next question. And then when you're talking about late bus, are you talking about for the high school, for the middle school, for both? Thank you, good question. We're talking about for the high school only. So the high school has after school help, it has after school clubs. Our middle school doesn't really have uh, that much going on after school. It has some after school programming, but there's no sports teams, there's no uh, club meetings or. Yeah, so I would get, I would just, um, only because I, I've heard from folks in my district who were whose kids needed help after school in middle school. Uh, if that's if that's not something that is really a thing in middle school, just curious when kids get extra help. And if not after school, great. But if after school, maybe we need to consider an after school bus there too. 
Dr. Provost, do you want to speak to that? Uh, I actually don't have the information to speak to that. I wanted to say that everything that you said is correct, and I just wanted to um, offer a little vocabulary lesson around civil dawn because it's one of the many terms that I've learned in my journey of, of trying to get a later start for the high school. Um, so civil dawn is not the same thing as saying sunrise. Um, civil dawn is, is the, the, the time when it gets bright enough to be outside, which around here is before sunrise because we have mountains and we have other things, but the, um, the light is still out and about and it is still a time when it's considered okay for people to be waiting for buses. So I just, I didn't want anyone to look up sunrise times and, and feel like we had given misinformation. Okay, we have a hand from uh, member Condon has his hand up next. Thank you. Uh, I, I believe I understand your proposals, but just to confirm uh, the way you're looking at it, no schools would have to share buses, i.e. Uh, middle school and high schoolers on the same bus, elementary and high school and so forth. That's correct. Um, Ms. Lieber did present us with those options, um, including, I kind of loved this, she had a family plan where the whole family gets picked up on the bus and rides the bus together, but um, those options turned out to be pretty expensive and it also means that you have a lot of kids sitting on the bus for a long time as you drop off from, you know, school to school, so. That's why they, we discounted those. So, and just to go back to um, Member Levy's question, I mean, my sense of the middle school, having had kids there, is that it after school help is not a, doesn't it doesn't work that way at the middle school, whereas it does at the high school. Kids often go during lunchtime and get help, um, but I haven't really heard of uh, after school help. So, Member Voss, you have your hand up next. Thank you, and um, I am on the subcommittee, and thank you, uh, Member Busansky. I agree with your overview, and I want to echo just how much work um, Ms. Lieber did on this and all the plans she presented. Um, two comments. One, um, just for perspective, right now, high school students get picked up at 6.30 or 6.40. I forget which it is, but it's quite early, their first stop. So. Um, while 715 sounds early, I think that puts it in perspective a little um, that we're moving later for on average for ever, uh, you know, the, the group. And then the other comment I have, um, I do think we might have asked for information on a late bus for JFK and we might get it. And we, I think we did talk a little bit about perhaps JFK and the high school could share a late bus. I'm not quite sure what she said about that. I think it's still on our conversation. And I want to share that a group of us, about half of us, did visit the schools earlier this year, including JFK, and we sat with JFK students um, over lunch. And that was one of the resounding things that, for me, came out of the conversation with the students, that they have after-school activities. It's, it's more like clubs. It's not after-school help with teachers. And they, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Provost or anyone else, but these activities are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And some kids definitely felt like they didn't have access to staying for these activities, which last maybe an hour to an hour and a half after school because there was no transportation home. So I, I wanna keep that conversation alive and um, it's not clear you would need a late bus Monday and Friday at the middle school. And it's not clear to me if you, you know, maybe could share with the high school. Ms. Lamica, you have your hand up next. So I did just want to confirm, I think at our last budget, at our last subcommittee meeting talking about it, that was one of the things that Tammy was going to look into is possibly having a high school, middle school pickup in the afternoon for a late bus. So they'd be picked up at the same time and dropped off in the same locations, but it'd be more of a, a hub drop off than trying to make every single stop on every single route is what she was looking at. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, are there any other questions about um, the committee's work, Member Gold? Um, yeah, I, I want to uh, second how much I appreciate the work that Tammy's done and Cami and, and the subcommittee's done. We've met a lot recently, and I just want to have it in our thoughts about how how difficult, you know, we do have our, a meeting next month with the budget subcommittee, and we're kind of like 
going with this whole timeline that we originally created as a school committee to get up plans and proposals and votes and all that for September and um, everything was September, October or whatever it was. But um, I just want to be cognizant of how challenging things are right now. And they're probably going to be over the summer and whether or not, how do we prioritize this in that whole, whole, uh, in the whole understanding of what's going on right now, because it's definitely takes time from the district and takes time from school committee and, and how do we prioritize that? So I wanted to put that out there because it would have to probably be a, a act or a motion or what have you from the school committee as to whether or not we do proceed with this. Okay, um, Ms. Busanski, did you want to respond to that or anyone from the committee want to respond to that? Uh, uh, well, you know, we did. Sure, might change, but um, from where we were when we started talking about this, so that may have an impact. Right. Absolutely. I mean, we did talk about how the budget impact, you know, what the impact would be on the budget, et cetera, and how that might change this whole picture. That's what felt so promising about how, coming up with two revenue neutral proposals, at least. Um, but, uh, you know, we've done basically, as we discussed this in our budget and property subcommittee, Ms. Lieber's done the majority of the work I think already. Um, so it's not really a lot of additional work and it seems like she's gonna need to switch gears pretty soon. Hence, in our June meeting, I think we're hoping to wrap this up and have her come to the next school committee to discuss it with the full school committee. So it seems like we are you know, pretty much on track. It was good to reread the minutes that Annie sent around um, and just remember that we did what the timeline was for presenting this to the public. So to try and get out a couple of proposals in September so that um, we could get some community feedback and make a decision around October, November. So people had enough time to prepare. So it seems like we're on track to do that. Thank you. Um, student representative um, Hardin has her hand up next. Yeah, I was just wondering about um, I feel like I may have missed something that you said before, but I was wondering about the students who may or families who may need their older kids to watch younger students um, after school. And if that was something you were taking into consideration with this plan or. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I that's a very good point. I think I said earlier, that's the greatest con to both of these um, proposals. And I think we'd have to try to um, work with the PTOs and the school councils and see if there's some creative thinking around what um, parents might be able to do, but that would be an adjustment. We never, you know, I know in your survey, Eleanor, the student union survey, because we were just thinking of moving everything a half an hour, we never surveyed any parents or students uh, to find out how many, you know, what that kind of, what that number is. Right, to yeah. Quantify how many kids pick up younger students. So we've never looked at that. So that's something we could think about asking okay. in the fall. Yeah. Um, and try to get a handle on it. Okay, interesting. But um, every proposal we consider definitely has pros and cons and so. Yeah, nothing's perfect. I feel like we've all kind of learned that, that we can't, get everything in the same plan. So yeah, I just wanted to check in about that. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, um, Ms. Fallon, you have your hand up next. Member Fallon. Yeah, I, I would just, I'd like to be cognizant of the fact that even by the fall of 2021, we may still be dealing with um, issues related to the pandemic and social distancing, and we may need additional time in between bus routes for disinfecting buses, or we may have to alter them because of the number of students allowed on a bus. And so I do want us to keep sort of a flexible mindset about when this would be implemented and realize that um, so much of what we're planning is based on unknowns right now. Um, I know we're all really motivated to make this happen, but it seems like, um, beyond not knowing the budgetary issues, um, if, if the routes become longer due to circumstances beyond our control that are related to the pandemic, that would certainly change things a lot, I think. Um, and I think it's only fair for the community to be aware of that if we're gonna be sending out surveys to them asking their opinions. Um, so it's just something I wanted to bring up. Thank you, uh, Member Voss. Um, and I'm just, 
sharing some things we talked about in our meeting along those lines. Um, we, we even acknowledge there might be a lot more parents not wanting to put their kids on buses, so we may have a lot fewer bus riders. So there is a lot of unknowns in terms of what we could do. Um, and certainly we're aware of that, but we also felt like we're getting, I feel like we're getting pretty close to some options to present back to the community and the momentum is pretty good um, in terms of the work that's already been done and I'd hate to lose it at this point. Um, the other thing, Eleanor, that we talked about, and I, I don't know the answer to your question, but just as a observation, is a lot of families put their children in before school care because work starts before nine, and then their kids are also in after school care. So if school started earlier, um, then potentially those kids would just be in one form of, of extra, you know, care and it would be fewer transitions. So it's just another facet of what it could look like. And then the final thing I wanted to share is we have asked to invite um, Mr. Morrison or somebody with a lot better knowledge of sort of the end of the day sports stuff at the high school to help us inform um, some of the, the decisions that might need to be made around, is it, does it go high school JFK or JFK high school? So we're still collecting a little information on all of those things. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there any more that you have to report from the budget and uh, property um, subcommittee? No, that's all for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much to the committee for their work and obviously to our um, staff members who've contributed to this process. The um, next report is from the R Rules and Policy Subcommittee and I'll turn that over to member Fallon. Thank you. Um, we met once uh, since our last meeting. Um, first, I would like to ask um, to have policy IKF graduation requirements referred to the rules and policy subcommittee kind of preemptively in the event that we need to start discussing um, any sort of changes in graduation requirements as a result of the closure of if for any reason Smith College isn't open in the fall, um, whether we have dramatic changes in um, how many students are allowed in the classroom. So we just wanted to allow ourselves the flexibility and we can't take up any business as a subcommittee if it hasn't been referred to us by the full committee. Um, so I would make a motion to refer policy IKF to the rules and policy subcommittee. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded to refer um, any discussion on that motion? Member Busansky. Thank you. Uh, so just to clarify, this is just sort of preemptively to have it referred in case you need to uh, revisit it, given changes. Yeah, we, we're still, new information's been coming out. Um, we're still waiting on um, Smith College to decide what they're doing. I, I don't know if John, you, if uh, Dr. Provost, you want to speak to this? Yeah, so I'm actually just checking my emails right now because I've been working on a document with the guidance department, just sort of scenario planning what, what some potential impacts might be based on the availability of higher education and dual enrollment programs for next fall. So if I can just have a minute to load this up. Um, what, what I'd like to share at this time, sorry, my phone is loading still, is um, for just looking at the Smith College campus portion of this because it's the biggest, I'm not, not Smith College campus, Smith College courses, if their campus was to be closed to our students um, in any way, uh, Right now in semester one, we have 70 students who are signed, I'm sorry, we have 62 students who are signed up in semester one. We have 70 students who are signed up in semester two. So if they were unable to access those courses, we would either need to make spaces for them in our classes, which I would, um, are somewhat tight to begin with. And so, um, forcing forcing all those additional students into the existing classes would be a challenge. 
Internships is another thing that might be impacted by the, the COVID situation. Right now we have 20 students in semester one signed up for internships and 30 students signed up for semester two. And then work study is another thing that might be impacted. Um, we have 11 students in semester one and 24 students in semester two. So just roughly looking at it, it's about 100 students potentially that could need to be quickly seated in existing courses for the fall and 124 students that could have to be quickly seated into courses for the spring. So um, we may we may want to try to create some flexibility for ourselves um, in the event that that those options that students are planning on right now may not be available to them. Does that address your question, um, Member Busanski? Yes, thank you. And oh, thank you for those numbers. That's very helpful. There's been a motion made and seconded to refer this um, to rules and policy. If there's no further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busanski? Yes. And Member Fallon? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, so that, um, that item is referred to subcommittee and you can continue, uh, Member Fallon. Yes, so um, next up we are asking um, to have the development of a school committee handbook referred to the rules and policy subcommittee. Um, it sounded as if the committee were expressing an interest in such a, a handbook for new committee members. And um, I did some research and found um, a school committee um, in the Eastern part of the state that had a really, I thought a really comprehensive handbook for new members. And I reached out to the chair of their committee and he's given us permission to adapt it however we see fit um, for our own committee. And so I don't think that it would be a particularly time consuming process. Um, so if that's something that the committee would like, um, I would be happy to take that on um, in our subcommittee work. Um, so I would make a motion to refer the development of a school committee handbook to the rules and policy subcommittee. Is there a second? That. Member Condon seconds. Any discussion? Thank okay. you for doing this. Sir. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on that motion to refer. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busanski? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. And member Serafi Cox. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, and last we have, um, we've decided to call it a first reading because it's, um, it's the first time um, it's this policy BEDB agenda format has been presented by the current um, rules and policy subcommittee to the current school committee and it is um, a, pretty significant departure in spirit from the last time we've done this. So um, this is a slight modification of the um, Massachusetts Association of School Committees recommended policy. Um, 
We modified it um, to include that the superintendent conferring with the chair and vice chair of the school committee will arrange the order of items on meetings agendas so that the committee can accomplish its business as expeditiously as possible. The particular order may vary from meeting to meeting and keeping with the business at hand. So in that paragraph, the uh, change was the addition of vice chair. Um, and the next paragraph, the committee will follow the order of business established by the agenda, except as it votes to rearrange the order for the convenience of visitors, individuals appearing before the committee or to expedite committee business. Um, that is in fact identical to our old policy and to the current MASC recommended policy. Uh, third paragraph, any school committee member, staff member, or citizen may suggest items of business. The inclusion of such items, however, will be at the discretion of the chair of the committee. A staff member who wishes to have a topic scheduled on the agenda should submit the request through the superintendent. Uh, the agenda will also provide for time when any citizen who wishes may speak briefly before the school committee. Um, I believe that is the same as the MASC recommended policy as well. Um, this is where it differs. All efforts will be made to ensure school committee members receive the agenda and all relevant documents no later than six days before the meeting. Um, our prior policy was 48 hours before the meeting and the MASC recommended policy was uh, three business days. Um, but my colleagues on the um, rules and policy subcommittee felt it was important that we have the documents, um, the agenda uh, and documents um, the Friday before the meeting as has been our current practice. Um, if documents are not made available by that time, the related agenda items may be pushed to the subsequent meeting, understanding that sometimes ex extenuating circumstances may require an agenda item to be discussed more expediently. Um, next paragraph is for each major agenda item, a specific time may be indicated for presentations and comments from the superintendent to be followed by committee discussion and committee action, if any, on the agenda item. That's the brand new addition. Um, and agendas will be posted in accordance with Massachusetts open meeting law. So the big uh, change to this policy, uh, the, the two important changes are one, that it now aligns with um, with the um, city charter in that it's the uh, superintendent conferring with the chair and the vice chair that are setting the agenda and that the big change we were proposing is for each major agenda item a specific time be proposed. Um, the, the MASC is recommended that if you have a policy on agenda format, um, that you can provide a customary business order of business or um, a sample agenda as a policy BEDB-E, and you all should have that. We gave a sample. Ironically, well, um, when we were looking for, um, for a sample agenda, um, Annie accidentally pulled up this one that had already had the times on it. So prior school committees actually in Northampton functioned in this manner and had the times already set to the side not so many years ago. Um, so at some point it changed, but it was our hope by setting times that we would be more mindful of the time um, and perhaps shorten our meetings and be um, and be able to save money and um, and keep people the public's attention to watch our meetings and be a little bit more disciplined. So uh, I would move that we oh this sorry this is a first reading so I would love if it, if anyone has feedback um, to hear that and um, we would be doing a second reading at the, and vote at the next meeting. Member Condon has has his hand up. Thank you. Uh... Member Fallon, uh, I, I fully agree with the spirit of the modifications here uh, and the intended goal. Uh, a few questions about uh, how they would actually work. So in the case of all relevant documents no later than six days before the meeting, would that, if, if document, documents were not available within that period, if they were available after you know, only a couple of days before the meeting, would that preclude the topic from discussion in that meeting? Would it, that topic then need to be pushed back to the next following meeting, if that were the case, or what? 
So that was the converse, that was the big conversation in subcommittee. And I hope member Levy will correct me if I'm wrong, but um, so the way that it was essentially stating that that was our expectation, but if they weren't, um, that members could ask. So for example, there are times when documents have arrived late and a member has asked to postpone consideration until the next meeting because they didn't feel prepared to, to discuss that. And so we are essentially stating like that was the expectation that if they weren't available um, six days in advance that um, those agenda items might be pushed to a subsequent, subsequent meeting and then saying, except that there are sometimes extenuating circumstances that require items to be discussed more expediently. And so it essentially is leaving us leeway, but putting that we really would ideally like to have documents available the Friday before the meeting. A member Levy well, has her hand up next. Well, I, have, I have one more question if you don't Sorry mind. The member Cotton, sure. Uh, the other major change, the, the last kind of full paragraph there about uh, the specific times indicated on uh, the agenda. Um, Kind of a similar question: uh, If is discussion cut off at you know the the time of the next item on the agenda? How can how does that work? You know, if the discussion is has a lot to it, a lot of people chiming in and whatnot, and it, and time goes beyond what was originally allotted on the agenda. What effect does that have? So, I'll be honest. Um, you know. For example, the board of directors I serve on for the Collaborative of Educational Services, there are often 20 of us around um, the table and we have agendas that are you know, about as long as ours, if not longer. Um, and we follow an agenda much like this where it's got the times and there are certain topics that do, we end up going over, but we're mindful of the time and the chair or the vice chair will say, just to be mindful of the time. And then we'll kind of rein ourselves in and realize that that time needs to be made up somewhere because we've all committed to ending by 9 p.m. Um, and so um, I think that it's going to be sort of an issue of the of our own norms of whether we are going to um, postpone that discussion to say, OK, we've hit the time. Let's continue this discussion next month or whether we're going to allow the, the discussion to continue, knowing that maybe we won't get through the rest of the items in the way that, you know, with as much time for discussion. So I guess that's feedback that I'd like to hear from, from you all. Um, did that answer your question, Member Condon, or? Yes, uh, thank you, Member Fallon. Okay, um, Member Levy, you have your hand up next. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Member Fallon, for really, um, really summarizing the work of our subcommittee really well. Um, I just wanted to add two things um, in way of explanation. One is the language about the receiving the documents six days before. We actually took that directly out of our norms document. So that's a conversation that we've already had. And although our norms haven't been finalized, um, the, our purpose for putting that language in is because we had had that conversation for our norms conversation. Um, and, and just to point out that there is the the um, the language qualifying that there may be a need to to expedite things because of urgency. Um, the other thing I wanted to add was regarding the times. One um, is just to note that this what we've what we've put out is a is a sample. It's by no means meant to be actual times that we'll use, and that our hope is that as the vice chair and the chair and the superintendent are putting the the um, agenda together that they will be able to say, you know, we think that this conversation we hope will take 15 minutes or 10 minutes or, and to be really mindful and thoughtful um, in preparing the agenda. It also allows us to say to folks who are making presentations, we actually really do need you to, to watch the clock. And when we say we're asking for a 10 minute presentation and you go on for 20 minutes, that gives us the opportunity to say, we just want to let you know you're over time. Can you, you know, go through this a little more quickly? And I think it also allows us as members to be mindful. I actually don't think this happens a lot with this group, but there are times when, you know, we want to share our thanks and then we share our thanks and then we share our thanks. And it's like, okay, like there, there are things that we could do to, to, to move a little bit more expediently. And if we had, uh, 
the, the timing on the agenda. It might just help us all keep that in mind as we're sharing our comments. I don't think we do a lot of like, I agree with you and then saying the same thing exactly again, but um, it helps to just know that there's a, a time crunch. But, but I do think that it wouldn't be, oh, we've hit our time, so we end conversation. If there's conversation that needs to be had, we have it. It's just a way for us to kind of try and, and limit the amount of time we're, we're using. Member Kaufman, you have your hand up next. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I very much like the thinking uh, that you guys are presenting about uh, making the meetings more efficient. And um, just from my role in terms of um, helping to generate the agenda and prioritize the agenda, the more information we can get ahead of time, like in the example that Member Levy gave, if, if somebody wants to speak or, or, or wants a, an agenda item to be uh, an item to be added to the agenda, it certainly would be uh, extraordinarily helpful to get a sense from that individual how much time they need. Um, and if we were going, for example, of trying to end at a certain time, like CES does, um, it'd be interesting to know a little bit more about how well that works. But you know, that at that point, um, Superintendent Provost, Mayor, and myself could look at everything we have and just say, look, something has to give here. We either need to shorten the number of items, move something forward, or shorten the amount of time that we're designated to it. So um, all of these ideas that you brought up, I think, are very positive. And um, there's been an ongoing, I, I think, whenever we have meetings that last till after midnight or beyond, it really is uh, not good for us on a personal level, and nor is it good for the committee itself to be negotiating or discussing things at that point. So um, hats off for you guys to try and streamline what we're doing. Um, I did, with that said, um, <laughs> I did want to offer an idea that I think would enhance our meetings. Um, and I guess, Member Fallon, this would fit into your um, the document that you gave us, which is the um, it's the sample agenda. What, what is that called? The uh, B E D B dash E. Yeah. So if I have an idea that would influence that, is this the time to bring that up? I'm a little confused about where we are. Um. So if you want to just like mention it now, but it would be uh, have to be made as an amendment. Um, during the, the reading, the second reading next month. Oh yeah, sure. But simultaneously, you're looking for feedback on both, I guess is my question. Uh, yes. Okay. So um, what I've been thinking about is ways that we can enhance the communication and um, reduce the number of miscommunications or confusion that we have sometimes experienced. And um, what I was thinking about was adding to each of our agendas on a monthly basis, 10 minutes for um, a new type of superintendent update, um, followed by five or 10 minutes, which consists of five minutes of the superintendent providing an update and five minutes of Q&A. And when I talk about the superintendent update, I am referring to something related to major goals and initiatives that we might be working on. For example, um, progress on our district improvement plan, progress on our code of conduct, uh, work related to our standards-based report cards, summer school, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many things that are happening. There's so many things that we have funded and there's so many things that we have heard about in the beginning, but it's really very difficult to, I think for superintendent and provost, so whoever's in charge to keep us up to date. So what I envision is um, brief updates on important items. These are just verbal updates from the superintendent, no PowerPoint presentations. Of course, if somebody wanted to share materials ahead of time, that could be done. But um, five minutes of a presentation followed by five minutes of Q&A. And um, I wanted to give you a sense of what I'm talking about by presenting one um, example. So let's take the code of conduct. This is something that um, the district has been working on for at least, I think a year and a half now, maybe longer. Um, and we rarely hear updates unless we go out of our way, but it's of something of great interest. So perhaps there would be 10 minutes devoted to the code of conduct and the superintendent might provide us with updates such as at what stage the committee that's working on this is at, how close are they to finalizing the new code of conduct, 
when it's expected to be implemented, and is it continuing to follow the Syracuse model as it initially was as a guide? These are quick sort of updates from the superintendent. We might follow those up by asking questions such as, will it be implemented in phases or all at once? Will the school committee need to approve the code or can it happen without us? What indications has the committee um, identified as ways to measure the results of this new approach to our code of conduct? Um, and that's it. And you know, as we move, as we move to towards developing a district improvement plan, I can see that these brief Q and A topics would be more focused and more aligned with our DIP goals and strategies. But again, for now, this is just one of many ways to get information. But the key here is that the superintendent will not need to spend a lot of time preparing or presenting. That's not fair to him. Um, but it will provide us an opportunity to get our specific questions answered which I think at times is um, you know, certainly not available when the, um, current, in the current format where the superintendent provides an update or the superintendent report. This is much different than that. So, so it's interesting you brought that up. I don't know if you noticed, um, Member Kaufman, on the sample agenda at 845 section eight, there was a section called school committee discussion topics. And we put that at the end um, because we, we wanted to have space for things exactly like what you're saying, uh, okay. a space for a quick discussion about something. But we wanted to make sure that those discussions were happening at the end of the meeting so that if we didn't have time, we could postpone those rather than postponing, for example, the rules and policy voting on policies or the superintendent's um, report or the business administrator's report. And so um, that was the rationale for putting that very last was to make space on the agenda for, for short discussions like that. I, and here it was just a sample, there was 25 minutes, but for something like you said, there could be a five minute discussion on a given topic with five minutes of question and answer. Um, and that would sort of build space into the, the agenda as well for if you go over in one area, make sure you know that you're going to lose out on your, you know, question and answers with the superintendent. <laughs> so you're <laughs> cutting into your own discussion time. Um, but yeah, so that was where we had sort of envisioned yes, um, those sorts of conversations happening. Right. I didn't know that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, does, um, just a quick, do, do other people have a sense of whether this makes sense. I know we're simultaneously looking for an efficient way of conducting our meetings and, and I'm talking about, and I guess the committee has already talked about adding time, but I'm trying to weigh the, balance the idea of getting better information throughout the year that would inform our decisions without um, making it an overburden on other folks. So it sounds like the committee likes the idea and I like the idea. So is anyone else that wanted to chime in? Um. We have some hands. I don't know if they're specifically about that particular item. Um, uh, Member Busanski has her hand up, but I don't know if it's specifically about that or about something else. Uh, it's not specifically about that, but I am happy to comment on Member Kaufman's proposal and Member Fallon. And, and I just just to say that I really do like the idea. So I think um, it sounds like you're thinking the subcommittee's thinking, Member Kaufman's thinking is sort of all in line that there's a lot of, uh, it would be a useful thing to have. So if that's helpful. Uh, the, what I did wanna speak about is, uh, well, just in general that I really like this idea of having some kind of you know set times. I think it'd be really important also in our presentations for people to have a really concrete understanding of how long we expect the presentation to be before uh, they begin. Cause I think we've just run into uh, we just had presentations that have gone on for a very long time and it doesn't leave much time for questions and discussions. So I don't know if that's something as a committee we need to come to an understanding about or, uh, you know, Dr. Provost, as you uh, charge people with coming and giving a presentation on a specific topic, but I think uh, maybe the agenda setting committee, that could be their responsibility to decide how long a pre certain presentation should be. Um, but I think that'd be a helpful piece of this puzzle and trying to sort of rein in our time. Um, but, um, and I will save this for a motion the next time, but I am interested in adding some language to the, um, uh, to this uh, policy. I've been waiting about three months now <laughs> that um, just to include in that, I guess it's the third, Wait, 
No, it's the paragraph talking about the six days receiving all relevant information. I'd like to include something about receiving um, information for executive session in advance as well. Oddly enough, this moving to Zoom calls has gotten us to a point where we now have for the first time received our executive committee information ahead of time, but I find it really useful. So, I, and I'd like to include that in the agenda, but I'll propose that in a motion, in a motion the next time. And then I just had a question, which was, in the third paragraph, um, uh, just if we really want, if, if it was meant to be that a staff member who wishes, why a st staff members were sort of singled out and we don't really reference um, how school, we don't really direct how school committee members or citizens would have a topic scheduled on the agenda. So that was a conversation and subcommittee um, our old policy did have the request going. Uh, if it's, it was if anyone who wishes to have a topic scheduled um, was submitting the request in writing through the superintendent or vice chair, um, and both our and and did not mention um, staff. The new policy uh, model policy for the MASC um, did have. Um, Staff who wish staff members who wish to have a topic scheduled on the agenda, submitting the request with the superintendent. Um, Dr. Provost, do you want to remind me of why why we were doing why we supported that? <laughs> I think it was because uh, there, are, much as Member Kaufman was just talking about, there are people who are in charge of various projects across the district, and they may know when it's time when it's ripe either to report on progress or to request a little bit more direction from the committee. And so I think it's those types of staff that we were referring to there. Okay, do you think it'd be useful to, to say in that first sentence who, how they would, I guess they'd suggest items of business by contacting the chair of the committee, contact in this case, the mayor? So, a former iteration had uh, right. people submitting requests to any any school committee member or the superintendent, um, and we can have however the committee wants. We can have this worded. I don't okay. have a strong preference. Um, if you feel that it's not clear enough how how the process would happen, um, we can certainly say may suggest items of business by emailing the chair of the school committee or by emailing the chair or the superintendent. Um, I'm not sure what you guys wanna propose, but we can think about it and someone can make an amendment next month. Okay, I will I will think about it and try to formulate an amendment next month or we can discuss it more fully next month. Okay. We'll come up with an amendment together. Okay, great, thank you. Member Voss. Thank you, I, I have a comment and a question. Um, so I love the idea of setting the time next to each um, section on the agenda. And I would encourage us to maybe even go a step further, which would be in our norms to collectively say, we aim to have the agenda end by a certain time. I'll throw out maybe 10 PM. Um, and obviously it won't always, but just to have some sort of collective understanding and then to ask that if it's looking like it's gonna be a lot longer, for example, a long executive session that we wait to have certain items or presentations that potentially could wait. Um, that's my comment. And then my question is following up on member Busansky, I, I agree that first sentence, we should direct people how to request something to be put on the agenda. And then the next sentence, I have a question about as well, the inclusion of such items, however, will be at the discretion of the chair of the committee. And I just bring this up as a question because at the very beginning, it says the order is going to be arranged by the superintendent um, with input from the chair and vice chair. And my understanding of how this works, and maybe I'm wrong, is that the three of them work very well together and probably all have a say in what ends up there. Um, and it isn't in practice, I don't think it's just at the discretion of the chair of the committee, although maybe that's a 
misunderstanding on my part, but I think it should be really clear who makes the actual decision. And um, it seems like we have a chair who is very collaborative and includes them, but if we're thinking ahead and someday there's a chair of the school committee who isn't so collaborative, do we want it to be, you know, do we want to put this word it in a way that it really is just up to that the chair. Um, so I'm just pointing out that it feels like it's a little different from maybe what the practice is. But I, I, I think uh, I'm not understanding your question. Are you saying you, so you think it should be the chair that's arranging the order of items? No, 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 no. I'm saying I, I like the first sentence. I think that's okay. what's happening. I'm fine with it. But I think all three of them have a say on the way they operate and they need to say what happens, I'm not there, but it feels to me like the three of them also, what ends up on the agenda is at the discretion of the three of them right now to some extent. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought that was the, the, I think that's the practice, but Mayor, could you weigh in? Isn't that the point of we were aligning it with the city charter? Isn't that according to the city charter that you set the agenda? I, I'd have to pull that up in front of me. Um, certainly, I think it's called out what the chair does, you know, uh, similar to the chair of the uh, that's president of the city council. I have to quickly pull that up to reference it. But um, yeah, again, I think our practice is we do it collaboratively, but um, I suppose ultimately, if there has to be a decision, I don't think we take a vote. Um, it's the chair ultimately, you know, under Robert's rules, under charter that that makes the decision. But obviously, the body can can vote to put things on the agenda. Ultimately, they can overrule the chair. So for the next reading, maybe we can check on that. But I think where I really noticed it was the first sentence says, it's specifically the superintendent's job to arrange the order, but he confers the superintendent confers with the chair and vice chair. Whereas in this third paragraph, it doesn't reflect that there's this conferring going on. It just seems like the chair is making all the decisions. And I just, my sense is that isn't, that it is more collaborative. So maybe adding something like that or mayor looks like he wants to say something. You're, you're, you're. I pulled up the charter just because I had it handy and um, it says the mayor as school committee chair shall preside at all meetings of the school committee, regulate its proceedings and shall decide all questions of order. The school committee chair shall appoint all members of the subcommittees of the school committee, whether special or standing. Um, school committee uh, chair shall have the same powers to vote upon all measures coming before the school committee as other members of the school committee, the school committee chair shall perform the duties consistent with the office and as provided by this charter or by vote of the school committee. Um, that's sort of what it says. It doesn't get down into the, to the um, nitty gritty of, of making the agenda. You know, so it depends on how you, how you determine what regulating the proceedings means, I don't know, but that's what it says. Okay, so yeah, so then I guess we do have some flexibility on the language that we can work out next month during then, the second meeting. My final, my final thing with that paragraph um, where it, it, it's echoing member Busancy's comment, but it was confusing um, a staff member who wishes to have a topic scheduled. Um, once Superintendent Provost explained that, it made a lot of sense, but I think that sentence in absence of why it's there and connecting with the first sentence to me was confusing. It feels like it maybe isn't necessary if, if we had the first sentence, but it seems like it's saying if it's a staff member who wants to talk about some work they're doing um, should go through the superintendent, but that isn't clear if, if it's just a topic, what does that mean? I think in part it's because we took the model language from the we took the language from the model policy for the MASC and I know other committees they have um, staff members that want to present on what they're doing to the committee.
they're excited about the work they're doing and they say, I would like to present on this. And rather than it going to, for example, the chair, the mayor, and the mayor saying, um, I don't know, <laughs> they would, it, they're asking for them to go through the superintendent who would say, well, that's great, but the best time for that to happen would be in the fall when we're talking about this or in the spring or so-and-so also wants to present, why don't you present together? And so I think that that's, um, that's part of it is that depending on the size of the school district and the, the practices they have in place, um, staff members do just approach to just want to they they want to present to the school committee on various topics. So I don't know how to make that language clearer to. Okay, so, so I'll, that's I'll, think, I'll think about maybe a little amendment that helps me understand. I understand. Thank you for the descriptions. I understand what it's trying to do. And I'm just sharing that maybe I'll try to clear it up a little. Okay, uh, member gold, you have your hand up next. Um, yes, um, is it uh, so one quick question is, is it even permissible for us to have a hard cap of sorts in our policy in the sense of like our meetings end at 930 or, or 945 is that allowable like can we and is it even worth considering that are we allowed to like say the school committee meetings last from 645 to 930 or do they have to have the ability to extend beyond. We have a 9 a.m. We have an 11 p.m. time limit now, but the committee can always suspend its rules, and the committee, some a member can always make a motion to adjourn, which is you know a privileged motion and it has to be taken up. A member can always make a motion to um, uh, you know to call the question, basically, which means if, if if a majority votes, then the debate ends and the matter you know. So there's all kinds of mechanisms. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't really, doesn't violate the open meeting law. The only thing that you have to do is post a start time. You don't have to post an end time. So really it's just the body, but, um, you know, rules can be waived, you know, rules can be waived. So you could put a rule in that says like we often do with the 11 PM rule. And then I ask people to make a motion to suspend rules when we get to 11 o'clock. So you can set that number wherever you want, but it's still, ultimately the body's decision whether or not to abide by it on a on a meeting by meeting basis okay unless, you can, unless you can convince five of your colleagues to vote no on you know suspending the rules uh to go past whatever time it is okay well so i guess i would ask if we can consider moving that 11 p.m time up to you know whether it's 9 30 or i don't know how that part gets done but i think it's in I think it's important in this agenda setting to figure out a way to, you know, that'd be one way to know the parameters that would help people in deciding how long their presentations could be, right? Like versus saying, okay, we could just keep extending it, you know, until 11 and then vote on it. I mean, I think that's a lot to ask of us, um, you know, and I think that does though have implications on public comment, you know, because, and so I wonder how you grapple with that one. If you guys have a solution to that, I do know that other districts actually have a cap on public comment when there are 30 people they say unfortunately you'll you get one minute because we have to get through all this other stuff and um i don't know where you all where we end up landing on that but i think that you know would be helpful for the public to at least know ahead of time that that you know public comment can't take until 10 o'clock at night and then school committee stuff become you know there's got to be limits on that as well um so that whole three minute thing is interesting um i do want to share the thought that I, I appreciate what member Kaufman was saying about having that time in place um, for the superintendent uh, to share his updates. And I appreciate how you guys had that at the end. I do worry, and I don't know how you grapple with that one where it seems like often stuff at the end, no matter what it is, is going to get on. And so it, that seems like an important thing to get those updates, especially as it relates to the uh, district improvement plan. So I wonder, is there a way to not have that? You know, I don't know what goes in the end, but <laughs> so, you know, so, something has to go there. I get it. Um, but and the last thing I just want to share is that um, I think it'd be helpful if agenda items were sort of tagged with what part of our district improvement plan they relate to as a thought, because um, whatever the, we're deliberating on and working on, I kind of feel like it should relate directly to our district improvement plan. District improvement plan. So. Um, you know, sort of, I just think I know as a teacher, when I get evaluated and I have to submit presentations, I have to tag it with what it needs in my evaluation. Sort of like 
what standard of my teaching does it come in? And I would love it if like we at least knew we're listening to this and we're de deliberating on this because it relates to this number or this number in the plan. And so if there's a way to include that in the agenda, you know, I think it would be informative to the public and also to the committee. I'm not sure I understand how that would work. Um, I mean, I guess I'm just thinking like if, you know, in the draft that, that you shared, you know, like that, um, if there's a presentation. Okay, but just so just presentations, because it wouldn't apply to consent agenda or policy. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think more, yeah. Yeah, well, so, it would be, so you're just saying presentations. I, um, I think that. Yes, because everything okay. else should relate to. Our business. Yeah. Yes, okay. exactly. Yes, but it just if there's other presentations that are coming on or visitors or what have you, whatever it is that is how is it supporting our work and make sure that. So that if it's not supporting it, perhaps we think twice about putting it on the agenda. Yeah, or if the person can at least tell us how it is, you know, that helps us to, and it also brings that very important district improvement plan further into the conversation every time we're meeting. Like it, it gives value to that plan. And so um, anyway, I love, you know, that's all I got. Okay, member um, Goldman has the next uh, hand up. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be talking about the agenda format. Thank you for bringing this to the table finally. Um, and um, yeah, I think that there's a there's so many pieces that relate to this and I, I just want to um, keep holding those and bringing those in like knowing that there's even sort of a ranking of some of the documents that dictate how we behave and perform. And so um, I really appreciate you referring to the norms, which of course won't be completed until this is all done. Um, but even the rules of procedure addresses some of these items. And so there has to be sort of some vigilance to trying to find the balance between how detailed or how, how much we paint ourselves in, in an effort to be very, to communicate openly, transparently, and clearly, um, both to align and find harmony among ourselves and also with the district, but, but then also with people chiming in, you know, so making sure it's really clear when we say this is what time things are happening, that people aren't turning on the TV at that time to see that agenda item and they missed it or they have to wait another hour for it and the, and like creating expectations that that we can't meet, especially as we're starting to move into um, new ideas about who we are and how we work together. Thank you for that. Um, Member Kaufman, you have your hand up next. Um, I just want, I've heard a couple of times that maybe we need to limit or put some targets on presentations or the length of presentations. So I just wanted to encourage the subcommittee if you feel it's appropriate to think about that and maybe we can add that um, as a target, whether it's enforceable or not, I don't know. I don't even know what the appropriate amount would be, but I just get the idea like if we are targeting a presentation of no longer than X minutes, that would go a long way. Um, and we can debate that next time if you can, if you have that opportunity to think that through. Um, the, the question I have that strikes me, you know, um, as Member Goldman said, we have norms and we have rules of procedure, but what I'm lost with is do people on the committee, does everybody know <laughs> what, we, what to do if you want an uh, item on the agenda? Have we ever clarified that? And if not, does this do that? Because it doesn't seem to do it as well as I think it might be able to do, but I'm wondering, did I miss something or is this still a confusing thing where people do what they think makes sense, but there's no common practice? Do you know, Member Fell? I mean, we can put the language back in that you need to email. I mean, our current policy is very clear on um, that anyone who wishes to have a topic scheduled in the agenda should submit the request in writing to the superintendent or vice chairperson. So our current policy that we are operating on uh, mm -hmm. under does spell it out quite clearly. So everyone on the committee should know how to get that item mm -hmm. on the agenda, as well as everyone in the community. Um, this new policy does not say that. So if we want to add that language in, we, we can. That was in 
the previous version of this policy? No, it's in our current policy that we've been operating under since 2003. Which policy? Policy BEDB, agenda format, states that uh, items of business may be suggested by any school committee member, staff member, or citizen. Anyone who wishes to have a topic scheduled on the agenda should submit the request in writing through the superintendent or vice chairperson. The inclusion of such items, however, will be at the discretion of the vice chairperson in consultation with the superintendent. This was the one that initially got brought to us because it made no mention whatsoever of the chair. Right, so you're talking about an, um, I don't see that here and I'm looking at the one that was sent out. So we must be talking about one that was an earlier version of this. Oh, okay, so this, <laughs> so when you go to our policies that are on the Northampton schools website, yeah, those are all the policies that we're currently operating under. Okay. What, I've, what was sent out to you was the proposed policy the changes, I don't think the original was sent out this time, but you can always go to the Northampton Public Schools website and at the bottom of it, under school committee, there's a whole section on policy yeah. and all of our policies that we're currently operating under are found there. Yeah, so the and current policy is what? Is what I just read, it's still policy BEDB. It's been our policy since 2003. Okay. And the language so I'm is sorry to interrupt you, but um, I guess my, I'll go back to my question. Do people on the school committee know how to get things, know what our existing policy is, or is that something that needs to be clarified? And I don't know how to get that, but I, I know for sure that people are not following that consistently. So um, is that something we need to, I would suggest that we need to re-add that in there because the old policy is not being followed consistently. So it, it bodes well to um clarify that and add that some language back into this one in my mind um oh, okay but i i just want to be clear that the language was in the old one and nobody knew it was there because they didn't know where the policies were anyway so it yeah. seemed a little bit irrelevant but i think more importantly that this information will appear in the handbook for new members and that member kaufman is going to make all the difference i hope so that there will be a reference to this policy most likely and to how to get items on the agenda in the member handbook so that all of the information you need to be a new school committee member will be readily available at your fingertips but we can add the language back into this absolutely so it was just a first reading um everybody can bring their ideas and amendments for next month and that was the whole report from rules and policy. Okay, um, member Levy, you have your hand up. I was just gonna add that um, the, the idea that people's presentations would have a time limit was part of the reason for putting the times on the agenda. It was sort of implicit in our putting the times on the agenda. So if that needs to be more explicit, maybe we, member Fallon, just need to write that in more clearly. Um, but yes to everybody who's been saying that, that that was part of the intent. The only thing that I do, we keep talking about presentations. We've gone almost three hours tonight. We had one very brief presentation by Mr. Morrison. Uh, I don't know that the problem is really the presentations. Typically, we also need to be more disciplined ourselves. So that's that. I just want to point that out. I don't think that it's that it's just purely presentations that are causing our meetings to go as long as they do, so. Certainly, and I think, but I, I, it sounds like there's a real desire for that to be included and just wanted to say that that was part of the intent. So it can be a both and, it doesn't have to be an either or. Okay, so are there any more questions uh, relative to this item, which was just before us as a first reading this evening? Okay, um, Member Fallon, does um, that conclude the items that you have from, from the committee? It does, thank you. Okay, um, all right, let me um, just get back to my agenda here. Um,
Excellent. So now we'll move to the business administrators report and the personnel report. So in an effort to get everybody back on track on time a little bit, um, I'm in your packet, you receive the fiscal 20 appropriation report. There's a number of accounts um, that I pointed out in the report that um, have some deficit balances. We're still working with administrators and taking a look at the entire budget this year. It's a little bit of a, an anomaly right now. We've got a number of accounts that are overspent and we'll have some savings in other accounts. Um, so we'll be working towards the end of the year, wrapping up where we'll actually land at the end of the year. Um, so if you have any questions about that report, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, also, I have no gifts um, that were received that were less than $1,000 this month. And I will need to forward the warrants that your representative has signed because I have, did not include them in the original report. Um, I did want to take just a minute to speak briefly about the fiscal 21 budget. Um, the superintendent and I were on a joint superintendent and business administrator webinar uh, just this morning with over 500 participants. Um, in my 22 years in this field, this is the first joint webinar of this kind that both the superintendent and I can remember. Um, this is also the first time either one of us can remember the state having a 112th budget because the revenue projections are not available to provide the legislators with the guidance they need. Um, the topics on today's call range from budget preparation for closing out fiscal 20, um, next school year, fiscal 21, as well as the following year, fiscal 22, uh, the CARES Act funding and reopening schools from a staffing, logistical and financial perspectives. In regards to the state budget, I would anticipate not receiving any approved state budget information till late July or into August. Um, it's my prediction that the state budget will be conservative and may need to be revised again during the fiscal year once more updated actual revenue information is available. Once the state budget is approved and based on the level of local aid reductions to Northampton, we may need to review the budget at various times during the upcoming fiscal year to make budget decisions. We'll continue to work with the budget subcommittee to develop any contingency plans we may need to bring forward to the full committee. Given the anticipated timing of the state budget approval in mid to late summer and only providing us with a few weeks before school startup, I'd like to provide all members of the school committee with the needed tools and framework they'll need to make informed budget decisions. In whatever way I can help inform, educate and clarify for members any of the school budget or how the state budget will possibly impact our local budget, I'd be more than happy to provide those tools. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, personnel report, any? Um... I do not have one for tonight. Understood. Um, now we'll turn to the superintendent. Oh, sorry, member Voss, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Ms. Lamica, for that. I, I think I'd just like to clarify something and it's a procedure about this sort of thing about your kind offer. Um, when a school committee member, Dr. Provost, has a question that's appropriate to ask Ms. Lamica about, how do you prefer us to do that? Do we go through you or do we just directly go to her? I think it would be good to, appropriate to ask a financial question directly to the school business administrator. I think it would be appropriate to CC me on that because sometimes we have to confer on things before um, delivering an answer. And I'll tell you quite often when you ask me a financial question, even if I'm reporting it, it's after consulting with Cami. So in, in many of these cases, it's, it's really a group answer depending on, regardless of who actually sends out the response. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we'll turn to Dr. Provost for the superintendent's report. Yes, thank you. Um, so there were a lot of discussions about plans tonight, and now we need to have a new plan for reopening schools. And as I've shared with you through, through some um, reports and studies and just best thinking about coming out of the COVID era, it's likely to be a multi-year process. So I think that we're going to have this running concurrently with the new district improvement plan. I have been talking with some colleagues about developing a new district improvement plan. And um, 
trying to find a way to marry it up with the recovery and reentry plan so that we don't have multiple plans running at the same time. Because um, I, I do think this is going to become all encompassing. And so as we um, attempt to just share what the community are thinking about it at this time, we are going to try something that we haven't done on Zoom before, which is to give uh, my report via video. So we'll turn it over to Annie and cross our fingers. Annie, are you aware of it, sir? I love the Joe Rogan. Do not point that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. See if it works. Can everybody see? Yes. So, Annie, um, you have to. When you go to share the screen, I learned this myself the hard way, you have to click share the sound of your computer. Oh, so really? you, yeah, so if you unshare and then when you go to share, there's like a little button in the side and I ruined a whole professional development because I didn't know that. Okay, if for some reason it won't stop. So if you like pause your video or and then. Trying to pause the video oh, and it's not pausing. Oh, gotcha. Uh, Apologies, this, this laptop takes a long time to do things sometimes. Okay, so when I share the video, I, I, I share a screen. And then on the bottom left of the big share window that comes up, it says like, check here to share sound of computer. Do you see that on the, like you click share and then that's how uh, I see. If I, hold on, there's an arrow. No, advanced sharing options maybe. Um, no, when you hit the green share button, a member of Serafi Cox might know better than I do on what where it well, is. But I was also going to offer to do it myself because I actually have the video up. I was watching it yesterday. When you hit share screen, it says share computer sound. Oh, well, I got it. I got There's it. Two boxes okay. at the bottom. Let me try it again. I found it. Thank you. Let me start all over. Sorry, Dr. Provost. A little glitchy. All right. Except maybe via Zoom. My hair is a little longer than it was the last time many of you saw me, and I'm sure the same is true for many of you. Allow me to introduce JFK Middle School Secretary Damaris Sanchez, who provided the Spanish subtitles for this video. Damaris and I are working remotely from video studios we've created in our homes, so please excuse any hiccups in this video. Hola, ha pasado mucho tiempo que, que, que hemos estado juntos, excepto a través de Zoom. Mi cabello es un poco más largo que la última vez que muchos de ustedes me vieron. Permítame presentarle a Damaris Sánchez de la Escuela Secundaria JFK, que proporcionó los subtítulos en español para este video. Damaris y yo estamos trabajando de forma remota desde los estudios de video y hemos creado en nuestros hogares, así que disculpe cualquier inconveniencia en este video. I am eager for a return to normalcy, and I'm sure that many of you are as well. The challenges of safely reopening schools are exceedingly complex. They require comprehensive and transparent planning that is well communicated to the learning community. This video describes the steps we have taken to organize our planning for a responsible and safe school reopening. To thoroughly and efficiently work through the myriad of considerations for school reopening, we have divided the work between eight working groups. In this video, I will take you through each of the work groups to explain what they are doing to help us prepare for school reopening. The return to school team lies at the core of our reopening strategy. I meet with the principals in a virtual environment every day. Now that we have established routines for the current school closure, our work has shifted to planning for school reopening. We study and discuss the school reopening recommendations from a variety of sources and support the work of the teams who are digging into the thornier issues related to school reopening. In addition to coordinating the work of these teams, we will develop and communicate a vision for a responsible and safe school reopening so that you'll know what to expect when we return to school. Reopening is only the first step in the process to our return to normalcy. 
Recovery will begin in earnest only once we have a vaccine and is likely to take several years. Our first response to the COVID-19 crisis was to establish an emergency meal program, maintaining and strengthening critical supports for students in need during this time of economic distress will continue to be a priority as we reopen schools. We expect that the economic downturn caused by the coronavirus will result in increased numbers of students eligible for free and reduced lunch in our district. We are taking steps now to be ready for a potential increased demand for our school lunch program when we reopen. We may also need new procedures for extracurricular activities and athletics. Social distancing and health regulations may require us to adopt new disinfecting practices for athletic equipment, to restrict close contact sports, or to limit spectators. We may also have to restrict field trips that involve crowded spaces or place students in close contact with each other. The operations team is thinking through these issues so that we will have appropriate strategies in place when school reopens. The operations team is reviewing bus transportation changes that may be needed, as well as enrolling new students and automating processes where possible through the district. Perhaps the greatest challenge for the operations team will be navigating the uncertain fiscal environment in the months and possibly years ahead. As of this time, it is unclear what process the state will use to build its budget for fiscal year FY21. The legislature could pass a 112th budget authorizing the state to continue funding at current levels to cover expenses one month at a time. The state's constitution requires that state budget be balanced, meaning that spending cannot exceed anticipated revenues. Current projections show a state revenue shortfall between $500 million and $5 billion for the current fiscal year and $4 to $6 billion for the next fiscal year. If during the fiscal year, the administration determines that revenues may come in lower than the state's projected spending, the governor must either reduce the items in the state budget or propose additional revenues or a combination of both so that the budget remains balanced. This could result in mid-year reductions in state support for education and other local programs. The operations team will monitor the overall financial picture and recommend strategies to best address impacts of reduced state and and local aid. Our instruction team is developing plans to assess students' learning loss when they return. Our remote learning plan was never intended to replicate the full learning experience of a normal school day, so we expect that every student will return to school with some degree of learning loss. We expect the learning loss to be especially acute for our most vulnerable students, including students with disabilities, English language learners, students who are homeless or live in temporary housing, migrant students, and students whose families are economically challenged either prior to or due to the economic effects of the COVID-19 crisis. Under normal circumstances, it is necessary to reteach academic and social skills to some students after a lengthy break in instruction, such as summer vacation. When we are able to reopen school, we expect to need to reteach all of our students. To the extent that this process can be accelerated through on site or virtual extended year or extended day programming, we will look for ways to leverage those opportunities to address the monumental remediation task that lies before us. This may also require us to modify or completely revise our traditional ways of reporting student performance. The instruction team will help us determine what assessment and grading practices are most appropriate during the recovery period. The coronavirus will be with us for the foreseeable future. To help us navigate the public health implications of reopening school in the post-COVID-19 world, we have formed a pandemic response team that will work with our public health department to advise on issues of student and staff safety. The pandemic response team is responsible for updating our emergency procedures. Our current pandemic emergency plan is based on a SARS-like scenario. The coronavirus requires a much more aggressive response, including scenario planning for potential future outbreaks and possible intermittent school closures based upon the pandemic response alert level in our schools and local community. The pandemic response team will also advise on mitigation strategies needed to maintain safety while school is in session. 
We have a special responsibility to the classes of 2020 and 21. The coronavirus has taken so much from our current seniors. In the immediate term, we have been focused on finding ways to celebrate their achievements in ways that comport with state and local health restrictions. We also need to support them with their plans for next fall, plans that may have been derailed by the coronavirus. COVID-19 related unemployment or market losses may have undermined family plans to finance higher education. Some students may learn that the schools they plan to attend will not open in the fall or may be opened only virtually or only open to commuters. In short, many of our graduating seniors may have to rethink their post-graduation plans. I've asked our senior issues team to maintain contact with the seniors throughout the summer to identify the major obstacles impacting large numbers of students and to identify some possible strategies for reframing their post-graduation plans to keep them on track for success after high school. Post-graduation plans for the class of 2021 are also likely to be impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. They will require specialized counseling services. They may benefit from many of the same strategies the team develops for the class of 2020. During the current statewide school shutdown, instructional technology has been crucial for the implementation of remote learning. The infrastructure developed for our one-to-one -one Chromebook program facilitated the rapid transition to remote learning with online components for most students. More importantly, both teachers and students had already been trained to use many web-based tools for learning, and our technology integrators immediately established virtual office hours to help teachers work through the problems they encountered with digital remote learning. Maintaining a robust technological infrastructure and teacher support system are critical for a reopening phase where periodic school closures may occur. The technology team will be responsible for managing sanitation and distribution of devices, as well as maintaining remote learning plans that may need to be implemented at any time during the reopening phase. A safe and responsible school reopening will require an unprecedented attention to the sanitation of our physical plant. The facility teams will be responsible for sourcing supplies needed to implement the most up-to-date sanitation guidelines for schools. The team will also be responsible for installing new equipment that may be needed, such as additional hand wash stations, social distancing cues, shields, or other measures recommended by state or local authorities. COVID-19 challenges our emotional resilience as well as our physical health. To address the emotional components of the crisis, we have formed a wellness team. The wellness team will help parents and staff understand some of the predictable behavioral responses to the current situation, provide resources for talking to children, assist with outreach to at-risk students, and provide emotional support for any of our school communities that might experience difficult losses during the course of this pandemic. This plan to reopen our schools will guide our work in the months ahead. As new evidence emerges about best practices for reopening schools, we will adjust our plans as needed. Together, we will get through this crisis. The path ahead is long and will test us. Nevertheless, I know that progress is being made on many fronts and there will be new discoveries that lead to brighter days ahead. Let's hold on to this hope as we plan for the reopening of our schools. you all. Um, that's my report for tonight. Sorry that it's a little bit long, but we have a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you, Dr. Provost, for that report and for that video for, for our school community. Um, I have some future business and uh, meeting dates to announce the negotiating subcommittee meeting uh, Friday, May 15th, 2020 uh, at 1130 a.m. to 1 p.m. That'll be online Zoom meeting the Rules and Policy Subcommittee meeting, Monday, May 18th from 6.30 to 8 p.m., also a Zoom meeting. The Ad Hoc Screen Time Subcommittee meeting, uh, Wednesday, May 20th, 2020, uh, 4 to 6.30 p.m., um, online Zoom meeting. And then our next school committee meeting scheduled for Thursday, May 28th, uh, 6.45 to 9.30 p.m., online Zoom meeting. 
The next item on the agenda is a uh, request for an executive session. And I would ask for one of the members to make a motion to um, make that formal request. I'd like to make a motion for executive session, request to enter executive session under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 38A, Section 20A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have been detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares the Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 30A2, Section 21A2 to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or the, to conduct collective bargaining session or contract negotiations with non-union personnel in chapter 30A, section 21A2 to hold grievance hearings, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay, member Serafie Cox uh, seconds the motion. Uh, okay, um, I will ask the clerk to call the roll um, to vote on whether or not to move into executive session. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. And Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so there is, um, the school committee has voted to move into executive session and um, because to hold these uh, discussions in public will uh, be detrimental effect on our bargaining or litigating position. Um, we will not return from the executive session. We will adjourn directly from executive session, I believe. And so um, we'll move into an executive session. Now, just as a logistical question, um, we have, um, we have a separate Zoom set up for the